Okay, we are recording for the second session. We're going to brains. Let's see here. EFA. Okay, so this morning we talked about uh, all the sort of preliminary stuff. Um, and now we're going to get into actual latent factor manipulation and checking and validation. Um, in order to do that, there's some sort of pre work we got to talk about or some preliminary stuff. Um, for anyone who's never done factor analysis, has anyone never done a factor analysis? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Yeah, right, Nancy. Okay, a couple of us, a couple of us. That's fine. And for those of us who don't understand factor analysis fully, which would be everybody, um, this will be a good review. So, first off, this is a latent causal model. You might call this a structural equation model. A uh, latent causal model. It has multiple parts to it. Um, I gotta do that on my computer, here we go. Uh, <clears throat> these uh, misspelled constructs are, we call these constructs are factors, latent factors. They're also called unobserved factors because you don't actually measure them directly. You measure them indirectly through all of these observed variables here. Um, so each one of these observed variables is uh, representing some column in your data set, uh, some variable. And then this latent factor is sort of being surrounded by these items and we're finding out an indirect measure for the construct at large. Um, so these latent factors are not measured directly, but we can through structural equation modeling software use the factor score for lack of a better word uh, for this factor to predict the factor score of this factor, even though those scores don't actually exist. Um, so it's a really cool latent modeling technique. Um, there are different parts. This is called the measurement model. The side that um, has latent factors being measured by indicators, these observed variables. This stuff on the left here, these are error terms. I mentioned earlier, every time you predict anything you, or measure anything, there's error involved. So here's the error being captured. Um, You'll notice even over here, this thing has arrows pointing into it, therefore error must be involved. Um, so we capture that error here. So this is the measurement model. Anytime you're uh, modeling a latent factor, the structural model is when you're saying there are relationships between these factors. That's a structural aspect. Uh, also, these are called the inner and outer model. The inner model is on the inside here. The structural model is the inner model. The outer model is on the outside, the measurement model. Most people don't refer to it that way though. They refer, refer to it from by a measurement or structural or causal for the structural. We have lots of different names for stuff in statistics. It's just to confuse you. Um, yeah, and I, <clears throat> if we wanna get real detailed, these observed items are observed items, indicators, predictors, Observed variables, did I say items, variables? They go by a bunch of different names. So just gotta know all of them. Uh, there are a couple of different types of measurement models. There's the exploratory model, and then there's the confirmatory model. Exploratory is unguided. You throw a bunch of items down and let the software figure out what the groupings of those items should be based on their covariances. Uh, whereas there's confirmatory, which is guided, you say, Oh, no, 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 these five items belong to this factor, and these five items belong to this factor, and so go confirm that for me. Um, so one's unguided, one's guided. There's also MTMM, we're not gonna do that in this class, don't worry about it, but I thought I'd bring it up. Um, and hierarchical, which we're not gonna do in this class, although I'll talk about it briefly. Um, so the EFA and CFA, I get asked all the time, do I have to do an EFA? Do I have to do an exploratory factor analysis? All the variables I'm using are established and validated. Do I have to do an EFA? The answer is no, you don't have to, but you're shooting yourself in the foot if you don't. Um, and EFA is awesome for detecting discriminant validity issues, uh, non-tightness issues. Uh, if these variables here don't hang together, the EFA will figure it out. The CFA is a lot, it's a lot harder to detect the discriminant validity issues because you're already telling it, this variable belongs over here and that variable belongs over there. Um, don't play with the other kids. Whereas the EFA, you just let them play however they want. And then you find out who gets to hang out with who. Um, so I always 
do an EFA. Even if, even, if I'm, even if I'm using all validated measures, I still do an EFA. Um, and then CFA, of course you gotta do a CFA. Uh, nobody ever had it. Actually, that's not true. I've had people ask, do I have to do a CFA? I can't get the CFA to work. Uh, and the answer is no, you don't have to do a CFA. Uh, you can actually generate factor scores in an EFA, which I'll show you later today, and then go straight to a causal model from your EFA. Um, but you cannot do a latent causal model without a CFA. So do both, that's what I'm trying to say, do both. Uh, <clears throat> EFA versus CFA again, uh, one is totally unguided, plop of variables, figure out the clustering. The other is dictated. I say these five belong to this one and these five belong to this one. Um, <clears throat> connecting this back to your data set, you collect data by interviewing people or surveying people. Those people end up as rows in your data set. That's where they belong. And every question that you ask them ends up as a column in your data set. So person number 251 answered grade question three as a five, strongly agree. Every value corresponds to somebody's response to some question on your survey, if you're using survey data. Um, and then the constructs are, com com are compiled, comprised, comprised of sets of these indicators. And now let's just do it. I have a bunch of FYI. Ooh, that's pretty. Uh, maybe we'll check this out. Um, I forgot about this slide. Uh, squirrel. So, <laughs> why do we use why do we use the software? Why not Why not just jump to the CFA? I guess is my my question. Um, and again, it's for discriminant validity issues. The whole point of the EFA is to find which variables move together. Um, and if we were to <clears throat> try to watch these variables and see which ones move together, we think we could po point it out, right? Which ones are moving together? Are you sure? A and E are definitely moving together, I agree. C and F. C and F. Hey, you're right, yeah. B and D. Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes not good enough. It's gotta be all the time. So what the factor analysis does is it finds the movement patterns for us. Oh. And it says, oh, they're inverse. <clears throat> Perfectly inverse. Huh. Yeah, which is, is, a, is a systematic pattern of movement. So the EFA finds these patterns for us. And whereas if we were to just say, no, these belong here, these belong there, we might miss something. That's why we do the EFA. Um, what it essentially does algorithmically uh, is it takes the covariance matrix um, and turns it into a pattern matrix. Um, a covariance matrix is just bivariate. It's how does BC1 relate to BC2, BC1 to BC3, bivariate. Um, and then what it says, well, how about BC1 and 2? Who do they relate to? And it does this uh, iteratively until it finds the groupings with least error. Um, so that if we were to move an item from one group to another group, it would not improve minimization of error. It does that until it finds the minimum error solution. Um, and finds these groupings like this. It's, it says, oh, these ones group together really well, but they don't group really well with these two. And these two group really well, but they don't group really well with these two. And so it finds all those factors or groupings. This is a lot like cluster analysis. Uh, for those of you who do cluster analysis, it's bigger in marketing than in some of the other disciplines in the business school. Um, but cluster analysis is just a 90 degree turn of factor analysis. Uh, in factor analysis, you are clustering variables or, or columns in your data set. In cluster analysis, you're clustering rows or people in your data set. So it's just a 90 degree shift. Now let's get into it, I think. Uh, let's get into it, then I'll talk about it more. Here we go. So open up that data set, uh, Bootcamp Original. 2018 clean. It's just the one we were using this morning. If you followed along and you're up with me, then we're good. Um, <coughs> here we go. Uh, <clears throat> this morning, before we started following along, I asked how many people were going to follow along. I'm sure we all had good intentions. This afternoon, who's going to follow along? Really good intentions to follow. Okay, so we will do it together. Okay. Brave people. This is good. 
Okay. Go to analyze dimension reduction. I was reading a, an article just yesterday that said, uh, here are the 10 statistical techniques you need to succeed in business now. And dimension reduction was number three. So this is important stuff. Number one was regression. Yeah, be, to being able to predict. Yeah. Okay, factor. So we're doing a factor analysis. Again, that was analyze, uh, dimension reduction, factor. We're gonna reduce our dimensions into a few dimensions. We are going to insert every latent factor. Um, this includes control variables, mediators, moderators, dependent variables, anything we are using in our model that is latent and ideally reflective. We'll talk about reflective and formative later. Just know that everything we're doing is reflective. Um, we would include all that stuff. So for me, it's everything from anxiety one to useful seven. What about the variables that were not valid? We already got rid of them, so we're good. Gender, thank you for asking. Gender is not latent. It is only one indicator. And so there is no factor. It is itself observed. So it does not belong in a factor analysis. Yeah. Um, what about uh, similarly income or uh, marital status or uh, number of employees in your business? None of those belong in factor analysis unless by some chance they belong to a higher order construct, some, <clears throat> some overarching theme, uh, which wouldn't be called demographics because that doesn't make any sense to have a factor of demographics because they don't correlate. Frequency would be the same, right? Frequency is the same. Single item doesn't belong in a factor analysis. Um, I get this question quite frequently via email. Um, people end up dropping. Huh? He asked you about frequency. You say I get that question. I do get quite, yes. Sorry. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, no, people will end up dropping things like gender and age because they don't fit in any factor. And then, and so they drop them from their analysis, but it's completely wrong. Don't do that. Okay, pull over those variables. All the latent, ideally reflective uh, factors. We should have, is it six, seven, eight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven-ish. Hey, there's Rob. Drinking his Joe. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna do some TurboTax here. Go up to descriptives and select reproduced and KMO and Bartlett's. And just trust me on these, I'll explain them in a moment. So these are the ones you're gonna check. They're gonna produce output. That's what we're doing here. We're selecting what output we wanna see. So continue on that. And then we're gonna go up to extraction. Oop, that was rotation. I have a slow mouse when I'm zoomed in. But extraction. And here, there are different schools of thought on which one you should use or if it even matters. Uh, Joe Hare is considered one of the most respected statisticians in the social sciences. He is the most cited. Um, and if you read his book, he says, actually, it doesn't matter a lot which one you pick. It's a tool. Pick the one that helps. So pick the one that helps. Um, which one's that going to be? If your variables are probably related to each other, um, use principal components. If they're probably different from each other, use principal axis. If you're not sure, use maximum likelihood. Um, I'll just use maximum likelihood. The algorithm that, um, that Amos uses is maximum likelihood. But some researchers uh, say Lorenzo and some Lorenzo Seba, those guys, 2014, said that principal, principal components is no longer uh, used to publish an article. Ah. So there, so there was a, for a long time, people would always use principal components yeah. and Verimax now rotation. It's not, it's not recommended these days. It, it's considered a soft solution. It will always produce a solution, whether it's valid or not. And so it is more rigorous to use principal access factoring or maximum likelihood. Um, there are others too in there. I mean, you saw there are several. Um, I always default to maximum likelihood. And then if I can't get what I want, I follow Joe Hare's advice and I try a few others. Okay, um, if you want, check the screen plot. I don't actually use it, but it's good visual. Um, this thingy here, eigenvalues, an eigenvalue is an attribution of value. 
Um, and what the factor analysis does is it iterates and iterates and iterates until it finds groupings. And every time it finds a new grouping, it, it asks itself, well, how much value is this uh, adding? And the value added is calculated as error minimization. So how much error am I getting rid of? Um, if it's not getting rid of a lot of error, its eigenvalue is low and it's not very valuable. So we want to say extract only factors that give us at least an eigenvalue of one that are minimizing sufficient amount of error. Um, or we can tell it, give us exactly eight if we want. But let's start with eigenvalues. Iterations, we'll just keep the same. 25 is good. If you don't converge in 25 iterations, there's something wrong. Continue. Whoop. Rotation. Again, kind of turbo ish Which one do I pick? Uh, Verimax was the popular one for a long time because, again, it gave you a soft solution. Uh, I, I usually default to Promax. It's fast. It's uh, discriminatory. It, it, it helps. It's good. Use that one. Just trust me on that one. Uh, the other ones work too. Will the solutions vastly differ? Uh, uh, depends on your data. But Verimax and Promax often differ quite a bit um, in terms of the size of the coefficients we'll see. Okay, continue. How we remember all these buttons and check boxes, there's a video for it. Lots of videos for it. Go to options, just skip scores for now. And we're going to suppress small coefficients. Uh, point three for now. What this is going to do, the suppression of small coefficients, is it just makes it easier to read. I'll show you over here in our data, in our slide. We're not suppressing any small coefficients here, and so all the coefficients are displayed. If we suppress anything less than 0.3, then all of this stuff right here that's less than 0.3 will be blank. So it'll just be out of our way. And so we'll only see the meaningful coefficients. Can I ask, uh, why 0.3 and not so why 0.3? Uh, the reason is it's <clears throat> the lowest coefficient I really want to keep is about a 0.5. Um, and we want to check cross loadings where an item loads in multiple places. And we want those cross loadings to be at least 0.2 away from the primary loading. If our lowest primary loading is 0.5, we want our lowest cross loading to be, or our highest cross loading to be 0.3. So anything less than 0.3, we don't really care. No. There is method to the madness. Okay. And then hit okay. Oh, but if you want, just FYI, uh, you could also just do this for a certain sex selection in your data set. Let's say you want to do it for males or only do it for single people or only do it for whoever, uh, only child or middle child. Uh, you could select which group in your data set you want to do this for. But we want to do it for everybody. So hit okay. It's going to run and have a bunch of output. Um, zoom in here. Okay. This thing right here, the camo and Bartlett's, it's a test of adequacy, of correlation. Um, there are four things you want to test in a, in a factor analysis. First is adequacy. Is your data appropriate for a factor analysis? The second is convergent validity. That is, how well do your factors hang together? Um, and the other is discriminant validity. That's how well are you distinguishing between factors, between groupings? And the fourth is reliability, how consistently uh, do you minimize error within a factor? Um, and so we'll test all of that stuff here. This is adequacy. Um, how big should this be? 0.9 is great. Above 0.8 is, is best. Uh, 0.7 I've seen, it's not great, it's okay. You, you can even get down to 0.6 and it's middling, but it'll, it'll work. Um, but again, ideally 0.8 or above. This sig value, if it's not significant, you have a major problem. I've only ever seen this not significant like twice. Um, and that's out of like 2,000-ish or more, 10,000 probably EFAs. Communality is another test of adequacy. This is the extent to which each item is correlated with every other item in the, in the data set uh, that you've selected. So the, you want to look at the extraction column. And anything less than 0.2 is potentially problematic. We have a 0 0.209 with social desirability 3. 0.205, ooh, social desirability 10, 0.128. That's really low. My guess is social desirability 10 isn't going to load well on a factor, but we'll see. We'll wait. We're not going to kick it out because of this. We're going to just watch it. So that's social 10. Everything else is looking pretty good. Yep, pretty good. 
Okay. Now we look at this total variance explained table. You'll see on the left the number of factors being extracted. Where it cuts off here um, at nine, that's how many factors were extracted because look, the eigenvalue right here is one or above. Below that, the eigenvalue is less than one. So it didn't add value, so we didn't extract it. It was a, it was a useless factor or a less useful factor. Sort of like an R squared, we want um, to maximize this cumulative percent of uh, variance explained. Uh, above 50 is best, above 60 is better, but above 50 is fine. Just means more of the variance is explained by the variables themselves rather than by error. So above 50. Here's the screen plot, I'll zoom out. Screen plot, this is a plotting of the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalue one is way down here. Anything above that was extracted. <clears throat> so anything less than that makes incremental added value. You can see this is the y-axis is the eigenvalue. So anything less than one wasn't adding a lot of value. That first factor added a ton of value. And then the next one, a little less, a little less, a little less until just tapered off. We have 47 items in our data set. So if we had all 47 items as their own factors, we would have the most variance explained, 100%. You can see that right here, actually. Um, but it's not very useful, not very parsimonious. Skip the factor matrix. For now, we're going to skip the goodness of test, a uh, goodness of fit test. Although, if you want to know uh, a rough approximation of the goodness of the model, is uh, or the goodness of the solution is the chi squared divided by the degrees of freedom. If this is less than five, you're pretty good. Less than three, it's really good. Less than one, there's something weird going on. So in this case, we're about two. Two's good. We have a pretty decent model, what it's saying, but it's a rough and old estimate. This reproduce matrix is just an estimate, or just a matrix of the non-redundant residuals. What you really need to know is this number down here, uh, the percentage. Uh, we want this percent less than five if possible. It means there's little error in the solution that was produced. More error or a bigger percent there means more error. Here's our bread and butter right here, the pattern matrix. This is what we're gonna be re referring back to again and again. Holy cow, that's beautiful. Oh wow, that's not what I intended. It's no good when it just works because then you don't learn anything. I uh, Wait for it. Let's see. Okay, so let's, let's look at this. It's, it's got problems, I just noticed. Okay, so anxiety. What we're looking for here, this is the, lo this is the loadings like coefficients um, on the factors. The extent to which each item correlates with every other item on that factor. Bless both of you. Um, okay, so the higher the number, the better. Up to one. You don't want it above one because that is like a regression coefficient You won't, or an R coefficient. You don't want those greater than one. So anxiety looks pretty good. These are all 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0.9 even. Anything less than 0.5, you get a little suspicious. You want them to average out above 0.7. Um, so we're good. Is that a question? Okay. You're good. Stretch all you want. Comp use. Looks like we're averaging out right around 0.7. We're good. Playfulness looks pretty good. Social desirability, oh, we have some problems. Yes, so excited. Uh, we have some major problems. Notice six, seven, or six, eight, nine, and 10, I'll zoom in here, uh, are all negative, whereas one through five are all positive. So we're gonna have to figure that out. Um, let's zoom out. Information acquisitions looking pretty good. Eh. Averaging out a little less than 0.7, there's also this number five, which is really low. We're gonna have to play with that a little bit. Decision quality, looking fabulous, except this, look at that. Whoa, what is that? 0.3, and it's loading over here too. It has its own factor. Like, is there anything else on that factor? No, it's, it's got its own factor. There's an empty factor here too, number nine. Okay, that's weird. So, it's not beautiful. Not so beautiful, this is great. So it came up with seven useful factors, and then this eighth, like, third thumb, and um, then a ninth, nothing. So let's do this. 
Let's just play with it by forcing it to seven. Let's just see what happens if we force it to come up with seven instead of letting it come up with nine. If you want to um, jump straight back to the analysis, there's right next to the undo button, there's a recall recent used dialogues. If you click on that, factor analysis should be the first thing there. Um, right here, next to the undo button. It's this one right here. Click on that and factor analysis will be the most recent thing, thing we did. Click on that, it'll bring up what you just did right here. And what we're gonna do in the extraction button, change this to exactly seven factors on uh, extract based on fixed number of factors. We want seven. That's what we expected anyway with seven. Let's hit okay. Camo and Bartlett's didn't change. Carminalities won't have changed. Total variance explained will have changed because we told it to give us seven. Does anyone remember what we had here before? Was it 57? Yeah, so 54 is not that much different. We're pretty good. We didn't lose a lot of value here. Um, that won't have changed. This is a little different. Go down to this. This will have changed the goodness of fit test, but we're still good. We're actually better. It's a little less than 0.2 right now. Um, nope. Right at 0.2. Um, here's a reproduced. We're at 6%. Was 4%. Eh, not a lot different. Pattern matrix. Here we go. Let me zoom in. Okay, so anxiety looks good. Compuse looks good. Playfulness looks good. Social desirability still has issues. Information acquisition. It's loading with decision quality, number four. Okay, so I'll have to play with that. And then decision quality is looking pretty good. Usefulness looks good. So the only one that's given us problems, uh, well, a couple, decision quality with information acquisition and social desirability. So what you do at this point is you have to distinguish them. You have to separate these. Um, we could, if we wanted, in order to meet discriminant validity, we actually might be good. Uh, I mentioned that we want the secondary loading to be at least 0.2 different from the primary loading. In the case of information acquisition four, we're good. It's actually more than 0.2 away. So we could do nothing about that if we wanted. And I think we will do nothing about it. Um, only issue I see though, is that information acquisition is averaging out less than 0.7. That's not good. So what we'll do, there are different ways you can do this. We can either try to move it away from decision quality which will help uh, increase its convergence, uh, its, its own loadings. Or we could try to just do it in a silo and see what is best for information, information acquisition by itself. I think we'll do it with decision quality. So do this. We will do another factor analysis, get rid of everything except decision quality and information acquisition. So we can discriminate between these two. Then I'm going to go to extraction instead of extracting seven, because that doesn't make any sense at this point. I'm going to just extract two. Ooh, or based on eigenvalues. Let's do it based on eigenvalues. Let's just see, because it may come up with three or something weird. We want to know. This is exploratory. We want to know what the, what, how our uh, items are going to play out. Continue, hit OK. Just jump straight to the pattern matrix down here. It did separate and it separated the way we expected. Not very helpful. So let's try this instead. Let's um, oop, get in the chat real quick. Negative loading on pattern matrix is bad, right? So it looks like a life support also. Yep, we'll take care of that in a minute. Okay. Um, let's try this. In the uh, s options, we're going to suppress at point one. I want to see where the cross loadings are. Because that's going to help us discriminate between these. I'm going to run it again. Pattern matrix. Ah, here we go. There are the cross loadings. Okay. I'm going to look at the biggest cross loading, which mm, is this one decision quality 11, which we wouldn't have seen before. Yeah. 
So that, that one is loading with information acquisition. Typically what I do is I go look at the wording of the variables, go see decision quality, what was it, 10 or 11, sorry, 11. Here it is. Um, and ah, there we go. Number 11 says decision quality 11. Right here, zoom in. This says, Excel helps me make decisions more quickly than it would otherwise take me. That's poorly worded. Excel helps me make decisions more quickly than it would otherwise take me. Well, first of all, it's poorly worded. So that probably threw some people off, um, which introduced error. Second, um, does this feel like an information quality, information acquisition variable? Mm, maybe it's just related when I have more information, I probably make better, quicker decisions. So it could be related. So what I'm going to do, since I have a whole bunch of decision quality items and they're all redundant with each other, I'm going to get rid of this one. No skin off my nose. Now you don't want to just delete them willy nilly. Uh, you want to be careful about how many you delete. But when you have seven items for a single latent factor, you're probably fine. Run it again. Go to the pattern matrix. Look to see how we distinguish. Ah, look at this. In oh, this is cool. Information acquisition, look at the loadings. <coughs> They're all up <coughs> since we deleted that one item. Let's see what the next biggest one is. <coughs> decision quality six. Yeah, yep. Decision quality six loads quite heavily on information acquisition. So let's do that one as well. Again, no heartburn over this. We're, uh, we have five, six items left still for decision quality. The optimal number, by the way, in the literature is four. It's what they, I can't remember which paper that was, but four is supposed to be the optimal number for a uh, reflective latent factor. Oh, look how clean this is. This is great. Those numbers look way better. If I wanted to change anything, I might just get rid of decision quality 13. Not only is it loading poorly on decision quality, it's loading somewhat strongly on uh, information acquisition. That's going to be my last change probably. So that's number 13. And then what do you report? Um, you report that as you're going about your business in the EFA, um, in order to achieve adequate discriminant validity, you're required to remove some items due to heavy cross-loading. That's it. And it's not a real limitation. It's just you trim some of your items. But look how clean this is now. Um, you have pretty good loadings for information acquisition, pretty good loadings for decision quality. If we now add in everything else, whoops, other direction. If we go back and add in everything else, we should look pretty good, except social desirability. Where are they? Uh, we want to not add in 6, 11, and 13 there. So the only ones we're leaving out are decision quality 6, 11, and 13. And then we want to make sure we uh, change extraction. Oh, it is on eigenvalues, so we're good. Hit OK. We're going to have a mess because we're still suppressing at 0.1. So let me go back and suppress at 0.3. That's in options, suppress 0.3. There we go. Pattern matrix, it came out with nine again. <laughs> we'll figure out why in a minute, but let's look at decision quality information acquisition at the top. Those are beautiful. Nice. That looks really good. It's, uh, they factored out really well. Good. Everything else still looks good. It's pretty close. Yeah, we'll see that again in the CFA. We'll see it again in CFA. That's right. When we get there, if um, if we don't have convergent validity, we we might have to delete that item. That'll be the first to go. Probably is information acquisition five. But since it's close and everything else is up, I'm gonna keep it for now. You should always err on the side of keeping items if possible. You you may feel like I wasn't doing that with decision quality, but. It's because it was an easy decision to make. They were cross-loading. We had seven or eight items, plenty to deal with. Um, 
But especially as you get lower and lower number of items, you want to be very careful about how many you delete. Is this the type of tool like Excel where sometimes you'll save 10 versions of it? Yes. You create all the old data and this version of the data, this version of that version. So EFA is this massive tr decision tree. Um, and you can, you can do this for days. I've known students, uh, doctoral students, who have done an EFA for a month because there's so many routes you can take. What if I go, be, it's, and it's because every item that you add or take away doesn't just affect its factor, it affects every factor. And so every combination of items that you do will result in a new interesting solution. Um, and so you can literally you know, just permutate through this uh, and find dozens of different solutions. And if I were to do this again next year, same data set, I may end up with a different solution, also valid. In fact, I've recorded every boot camp. If anyone's curious, go back and see what solution I came up with last year. It might be totally different than the one I came up with this year. Um, no, no, no right answer. A lot of wrong answers. Yeah, but no one right answer. Um, James, yeah. did you leave that when you rewrite it, did you leave the suppressed small coefficients at point one? I did. So, or no, I changed it to point three this time. Did you change it back to point three? Yeah, yeah. Because we didn't have any major discriminability issues we were concerned with. Yeah. I found over there on the decision tree where it has title to keep up with what I'm doing. I, I can, you can usually actually click oh, yeah. the label and say removed. Yeah, so over here. Six or removed. So you, so you can keep track of what you're doing. Over here on the left, you can double click anything and then uh, type in here. So this is like a suppressed point at point three or whatever, or this is removed uh, decision quality six, seven, 11, or something like that. Um, and so you can name it so you know exactly which factor analysis is which. That's kind of helpful. Yeah. The only thing that the SPSS uh, doesn't make is for other analysis that the free mm -hmm. software factor uh, that suggests how many dimensions or factors you you should use. That's cool. So you, based you on the AIC you probably don't need to, to do two or three or it just tells you what's the optimal number. Yeah. Yeah. So that's cool. Probably based on the AIC or BIC or something like that. Yeah, it probably iterates through and finds a minimization of error and says, ah, that's the point. Um, or it could do it by, based on like the screen plot here. So ch -ch -ch -ch, start losing value there. Cool. Um, so this one also does it based on eigenvalues. But let's fix it at seven. So we're fixing it at seven. Continue. Okay. And see how it looks. Pattern matrix. That looks pretty good. The only problem we have now is social desirability. Okay. What to do with social desirability? You can see you have four positive, five positive, four negative. Let's go look at the questions real quick. Here they are right here. So from the top, I always pr try to practice what I preach. Very positive, right? I never resent being asked to return a favor. Positive. That like the right way to answer this is strongly agree. Uh, I have never been irked, positive. I've never deliberately said something to hurt someone, positive. Those are all positive. Now the others, I like to gossip. I'm gonna say strongly disagree. Mm -hmm. I, I sometimes try to get even. Oh no, I'd never do that. Uh, I, I insist on having things my way. I feel like smashing things. These are all negative. So these are not the same factor. There are two, like they're two sides of the same coin but they're two different uh, dimensions of this factor. So we can either try to separate them or we can reverse, we can re-reverse them uh, if we expect them to be on the same factor. So my guess is we're not gonna be able to separate them, but we can try real quick. So back in factor analysis, bearing in mind that we've uh, marked off decision quality six, 11, and 13. Um, in fact, what I might do, just so we don't forget, I'm gonna go to variable view, uh, variable view, and go to decision quality six, 11, and 13. I'm gonna put these at the bottom by clicking on their row and holding control, and then I'm just gonna drag them down to the bottom. 
I don't want them to get confused in this analysis. So they're down there now. Okay, factor analysis. Just social desirability for a sec. See if we can force it to two. Actually, it would have naturally come out as two. Interesting. See, uh, see the eigenvalue. It's above one. Nice. So that would have naturally come out as two factors. You can see here. And here's the pattern matrix right here. Oh, interestingly, social desirability five comes out with the other <laughs> set. That's weird. Did you change it? You were still at 23? Yeah. So there are tons of cross loadings, I'm sure, um, that we're not seeing. But what if we got rid of social desirability five? Would that fix it? You can see it poorly loads anyway, right? Why do you think it poorly loads? Close to the same thing. Yeah, they're close to the same thing. How would you answer these questions? My guess is it would go something like this. Let's say this column is strongly disagree, this column is strongly agree. You'd probably hover your mouse over somewhat and be like, uh, uh, oh, heck, I don't know that one, right? There's probably a lot of error in the way we, we recorded this. Um, so yeah, of course it's not gonna load cleanly. Do you, do you care if the loadings are lower on the marker variable? Okay, so this is what's called a marker variable. You may be asking why on earth did we collect this data? Like why, why do we care if people gossip at times? Um, there is a tendency to answer just positively to everything or negatively to everything or just the way we expect they want us to answer questions and this captures the extent to which you are affected by that personal social desirability bias. Um, and so we collect it so we can parcel it out of all the other items. But to your point, do we care then if it's a valid factor? The answer is, yeah, but not as much. So we're willing to accept a lower threshold of validity. Would we report that? Yes, yeah. Uh, I have, and they won't make it to point seven. No, there's no way. There's no way it's gonna make it a 0.7. Do we include social desirability because it's a marker? Yes, we do include it because it's latent, that's why. Um, if it's latent and it's reflective, although its reflectiveness is dubious, um, we do include it in the factor analysis. So let's do this. To just try to separate things a bit, I'm gonna get rid of social desirability five and see if that helps. <coughs> yeah. What if the whole factor has negative charge? Oh, but it's not reversible. Okay, so sometimes this happens. Yeah, the whole factor has negative in, uh, loadings, everything. And the reason for this is because it is inverse of everything else in your data set. Um, and if that's the case, what you can do, try a different um, extraction method. So try Promex or try, or not Promex, try principal access factoring or principal components, and you may see a switch. Yeah. So do you ever actually remove any of the rows based on the social desirability if they've <coughs> answered everything just perfectly the way they Ah, uh, so what if somebody answered every single one? No, I strongly disagree. I would never gossip. I strongly disagree. I would never get yeah, even. I mean, showing, you know, high tendency social the answer is no, I wouldn't remove them. What I would do is uh, it, when, when we do the CFA, by including social desirability in that analysis, it will still take care of the extent to which social desirability affected their other responses, theoretically. Uh, so no, we don't need to remove that person from the data set because we're accounting for it later on anyway. Trust me on this one. I yeah. I still don't. I mean, I had to put all of these in there because I'm like, I have no idea what I'm gonna do with them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Of course. Oh, oh, somebody asked a question. Probably Rob. Let's see. Which brings me to my original question. Is a negative loading in the pattern matrix a bad thing? The answer is no. You just have to know what it means. Um, and in our case, uh, if it's on the same factor as positive loadings, yeah, it's a bad thing. We need to reverse it. Um, if you like, if you had one loading that was negative out of five, uh, you'd want to 
check the wording of that question because it's probably a reverse coded question. And then you'd re reverse <laughs> the question by making all the fives ones and all the ones fives and all the threes, uh, threes actually, all the fours twos. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, assuming we had, um, like, or we experienced a hair with uh, situation, uh, that's one plus. How do we do? How do we take care of that type of situation? Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding you. I'm going to see if I can uh, increase the audio volume here. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Everybody's awake so, uh, now. <laughs> oh, okay. So what I'm saying is this: um, I do mean we experience here with here with issue. Uh, what do we do? Haywood case. Haywood case. Thank you. Yes. What do you do if you have a Haywood case? Um, yes. So because this is just a, an exploratory factor analysis, we're not that concerned with a Haywood case. But if you really wanted to get rid of it address it last as the very last thing you do. If it's still there, even after you've adjusted things, uh, change the, the extraction method from whatever it is to another method. So if you're using maximum likelihood, try principal axis factoring. Okay. So if thank you. you still can't get rid, of it, get rid of it, use Verimax rotation. That'll get rid of it for sure. Okay, thank you. Hey, James. Mm -hmm. uh, to your question up there, I'm the blue shirt. Yeah. One of our advisors this semester gave us a great tip on the pattern matrix. It's like if you just cut them and put them in Excel, and you make all these iterations to them, and you just line them up next to each other, and you can make a little notation at the bottom and say, hey, I, you know, I deleted this particular yeah. pattern. Yeah. Okay. And you can, a history. Like, you can just kind of track them all along. That was really helpful. Yeah. So you have to keep different yeah. Or trying to go up and down. Up and down bar. Like, it's huge. Yeah, and you never know which one was which. Yeah. In Excel, it's a lot easier to read. Yeah. So for our EFA, no cases are allowed at all. I knew EFA, I'm not so concerned because uh, it's just exploratory. We're going to go confirm this later anyway. Um, so if there's a Haywood case in your EFA, me. If you want to fix it, change the extraction method. Yeah. So I have one that's just more, I want to think about it where would go away. Yeah. In that case, uh, if it's an EFA, still doesn't matter. If it's a CFA, it does matter, and we should take care of it. And there are ways to do that. I want to show you really quick um, a different extraction method. So here we are in the pattern matrix. We were going to get rid of social desirability five, but let's keep it for a sec. Let's do another factor analysis. Change the extraction method from maximum likelihood to principal axis factoring. And just run it again and see what we come out with. See, pattern matrix, there we go. It's about the same, not a lot different. What if we change it to principal components? Run it again. And pattern matrix, it's about the same. Loadings are a little higher. It's actually kind of, that's not too bad actually. Hmm. But I'm still gonna get rid of social desirability five. It's loading, it's loading on the wrong factor. It's not where it should be. So let's get rid of that one. Um, here, social desirability five. Hey James, while you're doing that, does, yeah. it, does it generally matter, hypothetically, if you had um, a social desirability one that uh, loaded like in a 0.4, but had a communality of like 0.173, just leave it. Just leave it, if it's social desirability. If it's on a marker variable like social desirability, Again, lower threshold for validity. Yeah, I'm gonna run this one more time. I'm using principal components right now. Um, and that looks beautiful. So let's run the whole thing, factor analysis, put in everything except social desirability five and those other things we didn't want, um, which I moved to the bottom of the data set. Pull those over, extraction, force it to seven. Uh-uh, we went eight, don't we? Let's try eight, because we, we separated social desirability into two. Continue, okay. And let's see what it tells us. It would have extracted eight anyway, ha-ha, based on the eigenvalue. Excellent. Since we've changed a lot, let's actually go from, from the top here. Our KMO is still good, 0.897, almost 0.9. Our extraction uh, in communalities, Still looking pretty good. In fact, all of them, even the social desirability are looking good. Um, we saw that, let's see the percentage of variance explained, 66%. That's way better. 
Now this is a bit of an artifact of principal components analysis. It does tend to inflate these scores a little bit. Whereas maximum likelihood would uh, give you a, a straighter score, a little more conservative. Um, down here, 9%, it's okay. It's still not 10%. So, so we have a lower threshold of validity for measure marker variables, yes. Did I hear that right? Yes. Is the, that the same thing for reliability? Yes. And does that also hold for control variables and moderators? Ooh, uh, control variables, yes, but not to the same extent. Like I, I, I'd, I'd allow slightly off, but not as much as for marker variables. Moderators, no. Moderators must meet the same uh, levels of validity. Thanks for asking the questions. Here we go, pattern matrix. Hey, they're split, look at that, beautiful. Looking good, I mean, it's not gorgeous, but it's good. And then good, good. We're looking at averaging out at 0.7. Looking good, 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 woohoo, we did it. I'm Two excited, questions. yeah. Did you, did you change your um, extraction back to maximum likelihood? Kept oh, I kept principal components. Let's do maximum likelihood real quick, just to make sure we're not fooling ourselves with principal components. Um, Here's maximum likelihood, continue, okay. And extraction values are a little lower. This is a little lower, so 57. Four though, 4%. Four and ah, it pushed them back together. Ah. But again, this is a tool. So let's try principal axis factoring as well, why not? Um, everything else looks pretty solid. So let's try principal axis factoring. And you may say, well, aren't you just sort of fishing around? No, it's, it's a tool. Just seeing what, seeing what comes out. So when you do that, so principal components, you think of it as least conservative or maximum likelihood? Of those three that we've talked about, yeah, they're the, it's the least conservative. With maximum likelihood perhaps being the most conservative. Here we go, social desirability. It does push them apart again, but it has lower loadings, but it does push them apart and everything else looks pretty good. So what is my conclusion? I've used three different methods of, of extraction um, and two of them say I have eight factors and one of them says, no, nah, this is really the same thing, two different sides of the same coin. Um, I'm gonna say, well, two out of three ain't bad um, and move on. Again, this is an exploratory tool. You're using it to explore your data to see where the discriminant validity issues uh, occur. Now, if we really wanna get into it, we go down to the correlation matrix down here and see, well, how strongly correlated are these two factors? It's factors seven and eight, right? So, factors seven correlates with factor eight at negative 0.4. That is not really big. Uh, what is really big? 0.7 or above. Because if you were to square the correlation, you get the percent of shared variance and a 0.7 squared would be 0.49, which is about 50%. That means they share 50% of their variance. So 0.4, that means they're only sharing 16% of their variance. That's not bad. That's that's not strongly correlated. So we're good. What would you say about those ones that were like 0.6? Yeah, 0.636, this is decision quality and information acquisition. It's close to 0.7, but not quite. So what's gonna end up happening? In the CFA, probably gonna end up kicking out information acquisition five or four. Can't remember which one it was that was cross-loading. But pretty good. Nothing's above 0.7 here. We're looking pretty good. At this point, I would say EFA done. We're good. Except we need to check one more thing. Um, we addressed adequacy. Hello, Amir. Um, and we addressed uh, convergent validity and discriminant validity. But we didn't address reliability. So let's address reliability real quick. Keeping our eye on the pattern matrix here, we're gonna to go to uh, analyze, scale, reliability. This is gonna do a Cronbach's alpha test for us. So analyze, scale, reliability. And we're gonna test each of our factors as it exists in the pattern matrix. So if we've removed items, they don't belong in this analysis. So anxiety, one through seven, all belonged. 
One thing we're gonna do also, we're gonna click on statistics and choose scale of item deleted. What this will do is it'll give us the Chromex Alpha for the whole scale, and then it'll iteratively remove one item and replace it. And every time it removes an item, it'll say, here's what your Chromex Alpha would be without that item. So we know if this item is helping or hurting our Chromex Alpha. Chromex Alpha is a measure of reliability. So continue, okay. And the Chromex Alpha in this case is 0.934. What's good? Above 0.7. So this is fabulous. Uh, the highest you can get is a 0.999 or a one. Um, so we're good. Could we increase it? Yeah, we could actually, if we got rid of one and seven. But do we need to? No. We're not in the business of optimizing our model. We're in the business of testing our hypotheses. If we can test them with a good enough model, it's good enough. So don't worry about optimization. Do you have a cross-loading? A cross-loading? Yeah. yeah. With anxiety? Yeah. Uh, we can go check right here. Pattern matrix, anxiety, nothing really. Although I'm suppressing quite a bit. But if I'm only suppressing at 0.3. So anything we're observing here that it would be cross-loading would be less than 0.3. And so it wouldn't really be a cross-load, not a meaningful one. But if it was cross loaded at that 0.3. If we were above 0.3, we'd be seeing it right now. Yeah. Right. But then when you go in and test, if it was within the acceptable distance, distance between, yeah. the, between the two, and you went in and did your complex alpha, you would still only do it for anxiety, even though it was cross loaded too. Correct. Yeah, I do it as it appears in the, in the pattern matrix. So in the pattern matrix, one through seven clumped together. So that's the clump I test in the reliability analysis. And then if you had a cross load that was under that clump as well? I, I might include that one in if I'm, just, if I'm thinking about keeping that. So in, in, in this case, let's go to social desirability. Remember social desirability uh, five loaded with six, eight, mm -hmm. nine, and 10. I could have, instead of deleting five, I could have said, well, really it just belongs with this other grouping. Let's re-reverse re its value and, um, and let it belong to that set and then I would include it in the reliability analysis with those other ones. Yeah. So however it, however it plays out in the factor analysis, that's how you want to test it. And you want to test it for each one. So we just did anxiety. Now we're going to do comp use. We didn't remove any comp use, one through four. And you report this too, 0.818, looks great. Could we improve it? No. What do you say? You, what I would do is I would take this pattern matrix, this final one here, I would copy this out Stick it in Word. Paste it, oh, paste it here. And then at the top, and what I would do is I'd have, uh, instead of the factor number, which is a useless value, it's just taking up space, I'd put its, um, its Chromex Alpha. So what was that? Comp use 818, that's number six, so. 0 0.818 right there. And I'd call this cron, cron uh, uh, alpha. Okay. And then you just do that for each one. Let's look at a potentially problematic one. Let's do social desirability and also um, information acquisition. So let's do information acquisition first. We didn't, did we get rid of any of these? I think no, let's see, one through five. Nope, we kept them all. It is 0.837, which is good. Could we improve it? Yes, by getting, getting rid of number five, 841. Do we need to? No, but that's something to keep in mind as we move forward. Number five is not helping, it's actually hurting our reliability, but not so much that we have bad reliability. But if later we're still having trouble with this factor, number five is probably gonna be the first one to go. Let's do social desirability and then we will plow through this faster than I usually do. So we'll go through the slides and make sure I didn't miss anything because I probably did. Social desirability, this gets to Rob's question and Dan's question. Um, notice social desirability, the first one, gives us a 0.62, not 0 0.7. There, there are papers that actually say you can get down to 0 0.6 and that's fine with uh, Chromex Alpha, it's not ideal, but it's fine. And since this is a marker variable, we don't expect it to be as tight and reliable as the others. So this is probably fine. 
Could we make it better? The answer is no. By deleting any of those items, will actually make it worse. Let's try the other side of it. Uh, not five. Here we are. You know, just for fun, I wanted to put five in there and see if it helps or hurts. Oof. Oh, it's because it's reverse coded. That's fine. Let me get rid of five. Sorry. Uh, there we go. There we go. Point six. Can we make it better? Yeah, by getting rid of number 10. And we knew that. 10 was kind of iffy. Um, but we'll just watch number 10. It only changes it slightly. You can see it's 0 0.603 versus 0 0.607 down there. So I'm going to keep both of these. How will I justify the lower threshold? Say, well, uh, find the citation for a low Cronbex alpha. I can't remember where it is. Might be on my references page. Um, and then just say, and it's a marker variable that's dubiously reflective. Uh, so we would expect a lower reliability score anyway. Okay. Wow, it seems like I must have missed something. Here we go. I went way faster than usual, or I talked faster than usual, or I just didn't let you keep up. Sorry, I went kind of fast. <coughs> okay, uh, I just saw people with drowsy e and lunch Canon Center at buffet. It's, I understand. So when you do the crossbacks that we just did, you don't do any of the uh, correlations or covariance? You can, yeah, you can look at those correlations and uh, see how strongly each item is related to every other item. Um, but you don't need to because you have the pattern matrix to tell you that they are strongly related to each other. That's what I just asked, I guess I was asking. So this correlations and covariances from the reliability are basically the same thing as the EFA that you did. It's the same as the loadings, yeah, in that pattern matrix. <laughs> they won't be the same values, but they give you the same idea. It's the extent to which each item is correlated with every other item on that factor. Yeah. I think I might have missed something. Can you go back to your uh, pattern matrix? Mm -hmm. and did you, well, I guess you didn't, you didn't label them yet. I, yeah, over here, I didn't label them. Didn't really need to, because, I mean, it's obvious that this is social desirability, this is anxiety. But, I mean, if, when we go to that step of labeling those and transferring it to Amos, yeah. are, you call, are, you, are we going to call that social desirability one and social desirability two? Oh, yeah, because these are two separate things, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I would call this uh, maybe positive aspects, negative aspects, <clears throat> something like that, positive SD, negative SD. Um, but also, if you if you have variables not named so, such semantically meaningful stuff, if you have like P1, P2, P3, uh, you'll want to name these. So in this case, factor one is usefulness down here. So I would name this factor useful, and then I'd put its Cronbex alpha maybe like in uh, parentheses. Whoops. Something like that. So, James, yeah. um, a common practice that for this, like how much of this would you take hypothetically and put it into a paper? Would oh, yeah, because we just did a ton of stuff. How much of that do you report? Would be important, but would, right. would normally with people in a paper want to see yeah, it, it, they want to see all your in a analysis. traditional paper like that I'm submitting to a top journal, uh, the only thing I would maybe stick in the main body is the pattern matrix, but probably that's going to go in an appendix. Other than that, I would put a few, I would have one paragraph devoted to the EFA. It would say something like uh, our variables were adequate or appropriate for um, exploratory factor analysis based on the KMO of and then uh, we extracted seven factors or eight factors with a total explained variance of 60%. Um, and there were no correlations greater than 0.7, indicating uh, discriminant validity and every factor loaded on its own more than 0.7, indicating convergent validity. Boom, boom, boom. That's it, just one paragraph. See appendix for patent matrix. Yeah, that's what you oh, and that's thank you. Last line. Okay. Uh, in order to achieve discriminant validity and conversion validity, these four items had to be removed in parentheses, the four items. And the chromex alpha would just be in the pattern matrix. And you, you mentioned all reliability scores were above 0. 0.7. Except do you usually do a total convex alpha score. I never do a total convex alpha score. Because it doesn't make a difference. You only want to know positive. I can 
could do a compute. Yeah. You could, but I wonder if it makes any sense. So the question is, what does it mean? Yeah. It means the same thing as the communalities and the and the Bartlett's test. Okay. So you could do it, and it would tell you the extent to which all items are related. The problem with an overall score is that uh, reliability, the Chromex Alpha specifically, is affected by the direction of the effect. So if you have any that are negatively correlated with others, they'll pull that Chromex Alpha towards zero. Um, so in this case, our social desirability and anxiety would pull our Chromex Alpha towards zero. So it would make a lot of sense. So you did mention about how we address on structure, but how about for this assignment? For your particular assignment, hypothetically, yeah, hypothetically, uh, for your pr particular assignment, a more detail is better. Yeah, but if you decide to put it all in an appendix except the pattern matrix, that is appropriate. You only get twenty pages. You only get twenty pages, right? Oh, 30. Oh, 30. Twenty for the appendix. Twenty for the appendix. Thirty plus twenty. And if I'm grading you, it better be twenty. So. So forty plus. Shorter is better. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah. Who's grading? All of us. Well, I'll, I'll chat with you later about that. Oh. Yeah. Over here and right here. In column number three, there is like percent of variance, like factor one explains the higher of this. Right. Higher percent. So other factor one explains to yep. minimum number. So does it create any kind of problem? No. <clears throat> so what's going on here, you'll see that the per percent of variance being explained by each additional factor is less and less and less. It, it's essentially like if, if we all got together down here and I said, all right, form groups. Uh, the first group you formed all together, one group would be useless, right? Uh, it explains humans, maybe, or scholars. As soon as you split, it adds a ton of value. You might split into men and women, or BYU, non-BYU, or Case Western, non-Case Western, or, and that explains a lot of the differences between the group. The next time you split within those groups, it's adding a little bit more, and you split those ones again, it adds a little bit more. So every time you split a group, you're adding a little bit more explained variance, but not as much as you were with the previous split. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. How about that, speaking? Yeah. If we uh, wanted the covariate error terms, yes. Uh, In the CFA, we'll get to that tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. The answer is no. Don't do it. <laughs> BYU. <laughs> Say dang it. Huh? Today, we're EFA today. Although we finished a little early, I might cover CFA today too. We'll see. Why not? Um, okay. Let me go to the slides and see if I missed anything. This feels like I must have. Some questions. Oh, questions up here. Thank you. So what is the lower threshold? <coughs> oh, for reliability, it's 0.6. Yeah, 0.6 is the low, low threshold. If you can't hit 0.6, then you've got a problem. <coughs> okay. <coughs> All right. Um, so we talked about that. When to use uh, factor analysis, it's to uh, explore, essentially identify discriminant validity problems and explore the groupings in your variables. Um, that's what it's really for. And why do it? Why not just uh, say, well, I have these five questions for, uh, in this case, this is a different model. Um, they say you have five questions for this factor and I have five questions for this factor. Why not just average them and draw and start doing regressions? Well, the answer is because you don't know how reliable those five questions are <coughs> at measuring that factor. Um, let's pretend that these items, these little dots here represent all of the survey questions and how tightly they're related to each other. Well, it turns out if you just average them, you end up averaging this and it's a bit of a mess. That's your blue average you know, versus your red average, which is everywhere. And so if you start regressing, you're regressing things that are overlapping quite a bit. Whereas in EFA, we trimmed out bits and pieces. So here, if this is the original, we trimmed out the things that weren't tightly related. And now we have tight factors for each of these factors. And we can say, ah, oh, this is truly capturing a single thing. 
And it's this thing that's clearly different from this thing, which is different from this thing. And now we can actually run the regressions and they're meaningful. Whereas before, there was so much overlap that, that you'd have what's called multicollinearity issues uh, or tautology issues where you're trying to predict something with itself, uh, which is useless. And sometimes you end up with an additional factor, which we did today, actually, with our social desirability. We had a factor we weren't expecting just show up, which was kind of cool. And it wasn't comprised of all the other factors, but it was kind of cool. Yeah. I'll tell you something that I haven't seen before. When we actually remove some of the um, items down below uh, on the variable, yeah. view, when we go over to the CFA, though, it doesn't matter that they're still in there, right? Because even though we're yeah. that data file, we're still pulling the pattern matrix from what we included, right? Yeah, the CFA won't be bothered by these items down below, um, right here. In fact, I'm going to also move social desirability five because we took that off. I'm going to move that down here. You can delete them if you want, or you just put them down below, and the CFA won't care because we're not actually gonna pull them into our CFA at all. Yeah. But it doesn't hurt if they're still up there where they were. It doesn't make nah, a difference. doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Yeah, they could be still up in here. Is what you're saying? Yeah, it doesn't matter at all. It just makes it easier for us to process uh, humanly. So anyway, you wanna test tight, reliable, valid factors. Also, you wanna reduce it. You don't wanna uh, do item to item relationships like on the left here. You want to do factor to factor relationships. Number one rule for factor analysis. It should only include latent factors. We talked about this with gender and then with income, they don't belong, but also they should be reflective factors. We'll talk about that <coughs> next slide. Um, do you guys want a three minute break real quick? Sure. Let's do a three minute break and then uh, we'll get onto this more complex stuff. Hey. Yes. How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, my voice is all right. My heart's working, which is amazing. Um, my heart wasn't working last night, so we're good today. Yeah, I'll let you know. I got gummy bears there to perk me up a bit. Huh. For those who don't know, I have a, a heart issue. I, my nervous system doesn't work sometimes. So, sometimes I have to lay down and eat chocolate. At least that's what I tell people. It's great. Sorry, honey, I can't do the dishes right now. My heart's not working. Could you bring me some chocolate? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let's say if my eigenvalue does come at six, uh, mm -hmm. again, I know I'm going to do the eigenvalue. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not my anger. Your comic's out. My comic's out yeah. is going to be less than six. Less than six. Or right at 0. 0.6 or 0. Okay. 0.599. That's pretty darn close if it's a marker variable. And it's a marker variable. Technically, when I write that up, do I just use that citation there? Yeah. And keep moving on? Or yeah. can I add a sentence saying that a better, go ahead and add the sentence, you know, a more valuable predictor is the CR that we're going to do. Yeah, you say chrome out, but um, even though it was low, look at the look at the composite reliability, which is considered a more current and rigorous uh, reliability measurement, okay. or more accurate is the right word, more accurate reliability measurement. Hypothetically, would I say that now in the EFA stage, or would I just say? No, that? you don't know in the EFA stage. Uh, we just say it's a marked variable and it's just exploratory anyway, and it's trending toward the right direction. And since this is exploratory, we're not going to kick it out now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I, you can actually, the citation that helps you with whatever with Chromebox is the actual Chromebox, so the Chromebox citation. So he says it. He says it in like Chromebox 1975. Or cool. Or I got it. Okay. Yeah, I got it. 47. 47. Woo! <laughs> oh, you went old. Yeah. I went oh, updated. Cool. <laughs> I went updated. <laughs> I could be wrong. No, but whatever. But he, if he said, has that, he has all of that in there. What's funny is these guys, uh, Fisher and Cronbach and a few of the others, from uh, early and mid 1900s, they wrote these papers that were seminal at the time, groundbreaking. But in their papers, they say, you know, a recommended, maybe a good idea yeah. threshold would be like 0.05 or thereabouts. <laughs> and and it's now law, it is a commandment, right? Thou shalt not be greater than 0.05. It's 
kind of like what happened with the caffeine. That's right. That's right. So it's like BYU with caffeine. There was never a command that you can't have caffeine on campus. And then <laughs> now we have it. <laughs> I wonder how those BYU students stay awake during the 8 a.m. biology classes. I know I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Mine was 7 a.m., my first semester here. Oh, wow. And I was dating, and there was no way I was getting to bed before 2 a.m. And uh, so I just slept every day during biology. Uh, I know it's chemistry, Chem 105. Oh. Yeah, I slept every day during that class. Physical science at 8 a.m. Uh, I went like five times. <laughs> I did that with guitar. I went twice and then found out from my buddy that they had had, they'd had the final. And I was like, oh, dang. So I, I called up the uh, professor. I was one of those students who called the professor. was like, hey, I missed the final. You were Rob Warren. <laughs> yeah. I did that in my last semester in my senior year of oh. class. Oh. I was doing fine in class. I, I had never attended class, and there were no assignments. There was just a final. So I was failing the class. But he let me take it. Without that final, if the professor hadn't let me to take it, Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, he let me take it. It was all theoretical. It was all music theory and not actual practice. So ha having not practiced once during the entire semester, I got an A in the class. <laughs> yeah. No, I never played guitar. It's just music theory. I, I sang, and I could play piano a little bit. So guitar, eh. Yeah, it's all theory. <laughs> <coughs> you gonna make it? Question. Yes. Is the awards to degree T A N any stuff? I sorry what? T A N. Yes. Do you still have the room to, to do that or no? To do studies on TAM? Yeah. Uh, there are locations that will publish studies on TAM, but very few. Because They're totally not top journals. That one. Remember you you reviewed. Yeah, I remember you. Yeah. And uh, I submitted to. Computers in human behavior. Yeah. They said it's over. Yep, over researched. Yes. Yeah, so, CHB is not going to accept a TAM study. So they just reject it. Uh, yeah. e even the uh, editor just rejected. it. Yeah. He, so he wouldn't even send it out for review. <laughs> yes. So you want to send it to some place like the ones I sent you, INM or uh, CAIS or something like that. Because it's just, <clears throat> if you had done more, you only added one component. Be because TA can get a one, two, three. Yeah. They can have three different, different layers, even, even more discussion about that. Yeah. So, so if it does, you just have to reframe it so that's obvious. So right from the beginning, you say, this is not your traditional TAM extension. We are doing this stuff well yes, beyond yes. it. Yes. So you need to say that in the abstract. OK, extension, not, not, not TAM, just a little part. Little bit, but I got a couple more. So you have to very explain that very carefully. Yeah, so that they don't immediately desk reject it. TAM is just one of those uh, theories that's just, it's just been over, overused, overrun. And so, I mean, there are like 20,000 studies on it. <laughs> Can I hear what you Yep, it's all being recorded. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. what, what did the term step for again? Technology? Acceptance, Acceptance model. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Well, we can chat. These guys from what? Uh, from the support group. <coughs> uh, uh, Lucid Index. Uh, yeah. Lucid Index. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lucid Index. Orion. Something. Okay. Orion. Yeah, or, Orion. Yeah. Something to replace the. Cool, cool. I'll have to check it out. I'm supposed to learn M plus this summer, so I'll just add it to the pile. The things I'm supposed to learn this summer. Huh? Learn M plus in my office? Yeah, on my laptop. Yeah, I've made six videos on it already. Um, I've never used it. <laughs> I used it the day I made the videos. So yeah. have we already? Uh, we will decide for sure in July, I think. <laughs> but I teach the next month, so I have to figure it out. But for us, we're going to. Oh, you're done. You don't need to worry about M plus. I think in Jagdeep's class, you'll do it once, twice. 
but not much. Yeah. Never, most of us, we never touched before. Yeah, you don't need to worry about it. If you have to learn it, it'll be for Jug Deep's class, just for one class or two classes. Just one? Yeah, just one or two lectures. Yeah. So don't worry. And I'm, I've already made videos for it. I'll make some more this summer. I'll make another dozen this summer. Okay, who are we missing? Dan again. Oh no, I covered it. It's fine. It's, I got it. Tomorrow's lunch, we'll go to the Cannon Center again. <laughs> or if it's not raining, maybe we'll go wander around. Mm. We'll go to the Cannon Center. You will. I just used the fee from you guys. <laughs> Take it out of that. Yeah. <laughs> So you should be thanking the undergrads who are, I'm taking their money. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, let's get started. Uh, we're not missing too many, just missing Dan, I think. And Brian. Oh, and Brian. And Bruce. Oh, Bruce, where'd Bruce go? I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, when you, like the social desirability of the yeah. items, when they're reflected, they're supposed to be interchangeable. Yes. You can take one out and make a difference. Yes. But once when we start, it all, doesn't it also suggest it should behave weirdly in the factor analysis? Yes. So if that comes up, something is out of order. So maybe it's not reflective, right? Or maybe the respondents or didn't understand it. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. So when we start taking out, at some point, doesn't it change what's left in the construct? It does at some point. We'll talk about this as a general discussion. Actually, it's the next couple slides. So let's make sure we cover it thoroughly. Um, Got a couple more waiting on chat window. What's the site for the point six? Joe Hare? No, it's actually Cronbach himself. Um, hope you heard that, Rob. It's Cronbach, um, 1947 or 74 or something like that. Notice that we have calculated AVE for convergent validity, but Wang's um, Yun Mei's slide said that AVE should be 0.5. Yeah, we haven't calculated AVE. Right, right. Yeah, we're going to calculate AVE during the um, CFA. So we'll get there. Don't worry. Okay, cool. All right, missing two, three people still. <coughs> yeah. Were you, no? Yes? Um, so, as far as the EFA, um, should we be concerned with the numbers, or it's more the, the data feeding that we should be really concerned about the future? So, during data screening, like, uh, and the EFA, we're pretty liberal still. Uh, it's during the CFA that we need to be pretty conservative. Um, but during the data screening, it's like we flag stuff, we don't delete it unless it's clearly a problem, like missing 48 okay. items or about values, <laughs> or if it's super skewed or something like that. During the EFA, again, we flag it or we trim it. Uh, if it's causing real problems that we can't resolve, we trim it. Yeah, like the extraction was in the communality was 0 0.107. Yeah. You want to come up with a good solution during your EFA for sure, um, because otherwise your CFA will, will struggle. No. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, One more question. Yeah. Does it make any difference to the analysis if you leave something that's a little questionable in the EFA? Because you could address it later. Yeah, if you. Good question. So, so for the folks on the uh, remote side, uh, we've had a few questions on how strict do we really need to be during the EFA. Uh, again, the EFA is a tool just for exploring your data, so we're allowed to be fairly liberal. Um, during the CFA, that's when you need to start being more by the book. Um, but again, EFA is really just to explore your data. So if you have a pattern matrix that's not like rock solid, Meh. It'll show up in your CFA anyway, and you have to address it then. What, 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 <coughs> value, what value would you draw? 
In an EFA, I say 0.5, that's the ideal, where I'd be like, anything less than a 0.5 is not gonna be helping me out. But in practice, I, I go down to 0.45, um, because often the, the loadings from the pattern matrix are gonna be slightly different and even deflated in the EFA compared to the CFA. We're less worried about it if it's a, if it's a marker variable. Correct, and if it's a marker variable, a lower threshold, 0.4 even. Yeah, I think in ours, yeah, didn't we have one that was? <laughs> now look at, look, look, I have a 0.323 here, right? Here's a 0.323. What I would do is I would jump up and try it in a different, um, in a different uh, extraction method and see how much it changed. Look, it's 0.448 here. That's with principal components. So, so, so you need to pick up a higher method. You don't have to focus on only one method. Yeah, choose multiple methods. It's a tool just to explore your data. So it's not required to have to use. No, we do not require. You must use maximum likelihood with ProMax rotation. Uh, that is not required. You can choose whichever one helps you out the most. That's the gospel according to St. James. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Is St. James reading my paper? <laughs> Maybe. I'm the one you want grading it. Here we go. Mark variable, we, we junked in the structural equation model anyway, right? Uh, Rob says, will we get rid of social desirability bias in the uh, causal model? And the answer is uh, probably not. It'll be a control variable. But we'll get there another time. Okay. So, back to here. Um, we want latent factors that are reflective, and also we want multi-indicator item, uh, multi-indicator factors, not single item uh, factors. So, let's review what reflective and formative actually means. Um, reflective factors are ones where the inter indicators are interchangeable. Uh, they mean roughly the same thing. Most of our items we saw there are all reflective. Uh, if we go over to our data set here, and look at anything. Here's anxiety right here. Um, let me zoom in. These all mean the same thing. I'm unable to keep up with important advances in new technologies. New computer technology makes me feel uncomfortable. I get a sinking feeling when I try out new technologies. New computer technologies scare me. I dread using them. It's a challenge to, to use them. These are all saying the same thing, right? I have anxiety when I use computers. Um, They're reflective. Whereas formative, these are composed of different dimensions. Um, a good example I have on the next slide here uh, is uh, health. Uh, a formative measure of health would be something like you have a balanced diet, you exercise regularly, and you get sufficient sleep each night. I know many of you do one or two out of three of these, right? But most, I, I, I can almost guarantee none of you do three out of three here because you're human and you're trying to achieve things. Um, and maybe you have kids. So one of them is a given, it's not gonna happen, like sleep. Um, but all together, these are a good indication of health. You take one away and it's a different measure of health. This is sort of what you were getting at. It's a different measure of health if we get rid of exercise, right? I, I say I'm healthy, but I don't exercise. So am I really healthy? Or is it something else I am? I'm a good sleeper, that's what I really meant. I'm a good sleeper and I eat well, uh, but I'm not that healthy. Um, whereas if you were to measure uh, some health or diet reflectively, a single dimension would be something like I eat healthy food, I don't eat much junk food, I have a balanced diet. All these things sort of mean the same thing. Uh, if you do one, you're going to do the other. Whereas just because you sleep well doesn't mean you exercise. I know lots of people who sleep a lot and don't exercise at all. Um, so are they healthy? Yeah. One way someone explained this to me was uh, formative is like the ingredients to bread. Bread is the construct, and all the ingredients are those dimensions. You take away one ingredient, like sugar, and that bread's gonna taste really different. Or take away a yeast, and it's gonna look really different. That construct will change. Whereas reflective, it's just slices of that bread after it's been cooked. They're all the same thing. That's reflective. I thought, hey, that's pretty clever. I did not make that up, that was somebody else. Wish I had done that myself. Okay, so quick quiz. Formative or reflective? Uh, 
job satisfaction. But... Yeah, there's a job satisfaction construct. Formative or reflective? Yeah, reflective. I'm satisfied, I love it, I'm happy, I enjoy it. It's all the same thing. You're not gonna, you, a rational human being would not answer strongly disagree to one and strongly agree to another. Wouldn't happen. Formative or reflective? I've heard mostly reflective. I think it's formative. <laughs> so, can you have software that is useful but not easy to use? All the time. Adobe. <laughs> SPSS. Amos. M plus. Yeah, pretty much every software out there that's useful is not easy to use. Yeah. So a rational human being can answer strongly disagree to one and strongly agree to the other and still be consistent. Um, could you have software that's easy to use that doesn't actually help you get work done more quickly? Oh yeah, no problem. I can, I can make that for you anytime. Uh, <clears throat> can you have software that's easy to use that you're not satisfied with? Probably if it's not useful, right? Okay. So formative. How about this one? The uh, R here means uh, reversed. This is a trick one. We'll come back to this one. Looking at multiple aspects of something. It's both. Yes. Ah, you caught it. Okay, so no one and two are reflective. Three and four are reflective. Five and six are reflective. But one and two are not reflective with three and four, right? They're different dimensions, different aspects of this thing. So this is actually a good example of a second order variable, where the highest order is something like overall job satisfaction, uh, but the lower orders are uh, coll collegiality, uh, boss fairness, and customer satisfaction, or something like that. Three different dimensions of your overall job satisfaction. So that'd be a higher order, second order construct. How about this one? Yeah, that's yeah, reflective, definitely reflective. Uh, that last one is reverse coded. I feel micromanaged is just the opposite of autonomy. Um, so that's reflective. So all of these would work in a factor analysis except this one here, the red one. What we do with the red one, oh wait, no, sorry. The blue one wouldn't either, <laughs> sorry. The formative ones here would not work in a factor analysis. This red one actually would if we did a separate factor analysis just for it, because we have multiple reflective dimensions within it. This other one, this blue one, would fall apart. And here's why. A factor analysis, I showed you up here, a factor analysis is based on, oh, there it is. Ah, too far. <laughs> Dang it, I missed it, Escape. Here it is. Um, a factor analysis is based on the covariance matrix. That's how it's built. But the underlying assumption of a formative construct is the lack of a requirement of covariance. The indicators for a formative construct do not have to covary. It is not required. So if you try to build a factor from a covariance matrix, using items that don't have to co-vary, they, well, they might not, probably won't fit into the same factor. So they don't belong in this kind of factor analysis, this kind of exploratory factor analysis. Now there are types of factor analyses that can handle um, formative constructs. Uh, it's just not in SPSS. Because uh, they, they, the factor analysis that can handle a formative factor doesn't use the covariance matrix. It uses a partial least squares uh, algorithm to find groupings. So we'll, we'll talk about that on Saturday. Okay, let me. So there were some reverse coded in yeah. there, and, and I was told that that was not best practice anymore to use reverse I coded. so agree. Yeah, I so agree. I, I hate using reverse coded questions um, because they introduce extra error into our data set. 
So my recommendation is don't use them. I don't. Uh, just a sec. We lost connection. Hello. <coughs> Uh, still thinking. Sorry, remote folks. I think you can still hear me. Yeah, there we go. Um, it's just struggling with our local system. Give me just a sec. My mouse disappeared. What on earth? There's my mouse. Okay, you can hear me and see the screen. Good. The local people just can't. Hey, <laughs> decided to, uh, ah, he's wigging out. Let me just unplug it. I have a question, please. Hello? And try again. Here we go. Please work. Whoa, I just lost all sorts of controls over here. What on earth? Uh, is, well, no, the, the projector storing the system here has lost. It's like the system reset or something. Dang it. I might have to call tech in here. That totally uh, shut down on me. Let's see. It's responding, but there's no input. Did this turn off? I wonder if that turned off. Oh, that's still on. Sorry, remote folks. Give us a sec. Oh, it's restarting. There we go. Our local display system just decided to restart. Because. Okay. And that. Come on. Still restarting, give it a sec. Oh, any questions while it restarts? Yes, I have a question, please. <laughs> Feel free to ask if you have them. No, I just comment that uh, for those of you that want the hair book or are planning to buy it in the future, he switched publishers. And the, oh. new, the new edition is out, I think it's eighth, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And it's now being published, I think, by Sengage. Overseas. Oh, okay. So cool. If you try to find his book now, you might get the impression that it's out of print. And it's yeah. Not. Okay. Interesting. Whose book is that? Joseph Hare and a few others. Multivariate data analysis is his. It's like the Bible of yeah. multivariate statistics. Oh, there we go. It's back on. Hello. Let's see. Hello. And booting. Here we go. HDMI. Hey, we're back. Woohoo. Okay, that was bizarre. Okay, so here's another example. I, I received, I, I had to review a paper uh, at a journal, um, and I told them they, I, I disagreed with them about the way they use this construct. Is this formative or reflective? Is the construct usefulness? <clears throat> yeah, so I asked them that too. Um, the name of their construct was information sources, which is problematic in and of itself. So formative or reflective? How do you have more than one main source? Yeah, there were so many problems with this. It's formative. I can, if I'm going somewhere, if I'm going to Salt Lake City and uh, I research up on it, I could totally research videos and not blogs. Or, but they stuck this in a factor analysis and did a Cronbach's alpha on it. But there's no assumption of covariance among these items. And boy, did we get in a, a spat. We fought over this and finally the editor agreed with me. Um, I mean, I wouldn't even really view that as a construct. It's not. It doesn't increase or decrease, right? 
So, ah, dang it. They hung together? No, they didn't. They totally fell apart. And so what they did was they treated it like a normal reflective construct, trimmed out seven items, left three that loaded together, and it still had a low convex alpha, but they treated it like a reflective factor. This is really not good. Um, and so does it mean you can make any, if you have enough items in your survey and you trim, you can always end up with You can come up with something. Test. Yeah, you can come up with something. Doesn't mean it'll be good. So <clears throat> what they came up with, oh, I wish this would show up. Come on. This is going to cause some problems if you guys can't see the screen. Sorry, remote folks. Again, the system is burping on us. Come on. Well, we can, if you want to comment on it, I mean, us, we can still have the slides. I guess you have the slides, yeah. It's just the recording won't have it. Oh, we know it will. Yeah, the recording will have it as well. So we might, oh, it reset again. All right, we're going to, I'm going to assume you have the slides. I'm on the fact, EFA slides. Hello. I'm on slide 18. And what they ended up doing was they trimmed all but three, let's say the first three. And then they had a regression line to this new factor. But what does it even mean that an increase in whatever leads to an increase in information sources? It doesn't mean anything at all. It's like increasing marital status. There, there is no such thing. Um, like just because I'm widowed doesn't make me more marital status than you, right? Um, that makes no sense at all. Uh, so how could they have used this? Is it a demographic question or something for informational purposes to determine how people are getting their information? Right. They could have, they could have created a groupings of types, like categories of information sources, and then looked at frequencies um, of use or something like that. They could have created a score or a, uh, a variance score, like how many versus how few were people using. Um, but again, this is a formative factor. Uh, so, I wish you could see what I see. All right, I'm on slide 19. That's funny, there are two 18s in a row. No, that's just, no, okay, slide 19. So, what can you do with formative factors? Um, you can't use them in uh, SPSS in an EFA. It doesn't work. It's built on the covariance matrix. They're not required to covariate. So you can use partial least squares, which we'll talk about on Saturday. Uh, right now, Smart PLS is the leader in partial least squares. I actually almost went to warp PLS for this uh, boot camp because I was reviewing a paper for Ned Koch. Um, it was obvious that it was his because it was all done to warp PLS and he extolled the virtues of it inside himself 12 times. Um, it was obviously his. And he made a really good case for why Warp PLS is more useful than Smart PLS. Um, and I was almost converted, uh, but then um, talked with both parties. And yep. so gonna question, PLS now I'm going to learn Warp PLS maybe over the summer, make some videos for it. What is it called? Hello. Warp PLS. Oh, warp. warp PLS handles some things that uh, Smart PLS does not and some important things, uh, in particular, curve linear effects instead of just linear effects, um, as well as uh, true formative measurement and true reflective measurement rather than uh, these aggregated scores. So better, some better estimation of error is what it boils down to. Can you use the PLS for reflective or no? You can use PLS for reflective. Um, the problem is, and this is where warp PLS Make, is, is better. Uh, the algorithm they use for reflective uh, estimation is flawed. It has some problems. Um, so the estimates you get out of it are either inflated or wrong. So it's kind of problematic. So what I'm going to teach you is how to use it, and you can use it, and sometimes it works. Most of works. 95% of the time, it works great. Uh -huh for both, formative or reflective. It's just there's 5% of the time where your particular mix of data or variables makes something go haywire and it just doesn't work very well. Hello, hello. Anyway, oh, it wants hello. to come back on. It's gonna think again. Okay, so that's, we'll do that on Saturday. Um, you can also, again, slide 19, 
uh, you can use aggregated scores. You can create averages um, or frequency scores. Mukhtar, uh, your video is on. There we go. Um, and uh, you can use them as a single score. Something like, for, so in the case of page uh, slide 18, they could have used a frequency, like how many of these were used. And then the construct would be number of data, uh, of information sources. Do they use a lot or a little? Does that make sense? You can regress on that. Okay. The next several slides are just uh, FYI, sort of thresholds, requirements, assumptions. Um, I'm going to just skip past 20 and 21. We've talked about 22. Um, this is the KMO and the citation it comes from. I mentioned anything about 0.7 is fine-ish, about 0.8 is better. Um, anything less than 0.6 is just terrible. More of those. Yeah, yeah. It's like 20, how many mm -hmm. respondents? Yeah. Um, maybe maybe my friends are in the rooms. Are rule of 10, 10 cases for every item. Is that so if you had 10 items, uh, 100 oh, cases. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there are actually several uh, different uh, formulas for calculating proper sample size. My The one I found most reliable to accommodate most, uh, most data sets is 50 plus 5x where X is the number of uh, <coughs> items. So if you had 10 items, that'd be 50 plus 50, five times 10. So by so. items, you mean only 10 questions in your Yeah, so, this is a, so typically you'd have more than that. So let's say you have 40, or let's say 50 items. If you have 50 items, then it's 50 plus 250. So 300 sample size for a 50 item EFA. And that works pretty well. So those of you who haven't collected data yet who are thinking, oh, wait up, I need to shrink my survey. Uh, so, or just not use all of it in your analysis. That happens too. So you don't use G power at all to determine your sample? You can do that too. You can use a G power calculator or something like that. Because it came out way less than what this is saying. Yeah. It, it, it's, it makes an assumption on error is the problem. So we assume error will be minimal it, with G power. Um, whereas the sort of robust formula I gave you assumes a broad range of error. So if you want to be safe, 300, could you get by with only 100 for 50 items? You actually probably could. There just might be some abnormalities in the estimates. So. But again, if you have really low error data, no, 100 would be fine for 50. So it just depends on the amount of error in your data. Let's see. Going through these slides, KMO, KMO, we talked about Bartlett's, we talked about extraction methods, we talked about uh, text here, let's see. Is it back on? It's restarting again. Let's see, text, several texts here. Um, somebody keeps saying hello and they want to ask a question. Whoever's trying to ask a question remotely, I suggest sending a chat of the question. I haven't heard you at all. Oh. My speakers are off, sorry. Um, it's back on in a moment. It should be back on now. All right, now we can talk. Mukhtar had a question. I have a question, please. It seems you can't hear us. Now I can hear you. What's yes. your question, Mukhtar? Okay. Hello? Yes. Yes, um, my question actually is um, on, uh, what do you call it, uh, the non-reproductive items. Uh, if assuming, um, I conducted my research and I eventually uh, have uh, what do you call, um, formative um, data, so to speak, and I have not, I have not had any form of uh, 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 experience or training on a PLS. Now, what do I do? Is there any alternative uh, or is there a way that uh, I can, you know, convert my data to become reflective rather than formative so that I can use them? Um, um, what do you call it? Uh, Sam, uh, EFA. Uh, and, Good question. Uh, yeah, and what have you? Yeah. So if you've already collected data and you realize, oh dang it, I have formative factors. What am I going to do now? Um, either you got to use something like Smart PLS, or you can create scores 
out of each factor. So let's go back. Uh, let me go back to my slides here and go up to um, up to here. Here, well, let's look at health on the right side. Formative. If I were to create a score out of this, I would say you get a one if you've done one. You get a two if you do two. You get a three if you do three. One indicates lower level of health. Three indicates a higher level of health. Right. Um, the higher the score, the higher the health. This makes sense. So I can regress with that. Uh, the number change is meaningful. I might also weight it and say, well, uh, sleep is maybe the most important thing here and then <laughs> diet and then exercise. So you get a one if you exercise. You get a three if you also diet and you get a 10 if you also sleep well. Um, each thing is weighted differently. And the higher your score, the higher uh, your health. So you can do that with your uh, formative factors. Now, when you do that, you're making a lot of assumptions and you're introducing a little bit of error. Um, but the way partial least squares works is with aggregated, essentially weighted averages. And so it's doing the exact same thing, even if you model it latently in Smart PLS. So that's what you could do. If you haven't collected your data yet, uh, then if you want to reformat your survey to collect reflective scales, you can. I, I, we should mention this real quick. Which of these, if you were to look at diet and, and health here, which one is a better representation of, of physical health? The formative or the reflective? Definitely the formative. Formative, yeah. Formative. Yeah. It's capturing a more robust measure of health. In general, formative factors are better measures of the construct. So why do we use so much reflective and so few formative? It's just because the tools available for assessing reflective models are more robust, more, uh, more refined, more vetted than the tools for assessing formative models. Also the metrics and like journal articles that talk about all the measures of reliability and validity and things like that are more established for reflective models than formative. But in the end, formative is probably more uh, higher quality measure of the construct. So in that case, form scores. Bring it. So. Yes. Uh, I don't know. We can make a binomial uh, reflective, no, formative <coughs> items. Mm. Uh, I'm thinking a uh, student is making uh, obstetric violence scale. So I think it's formative because you can link one type but not another. And I don't know. But it's a dichotomy because she said that it happened or. Right. It, yes or uh, no. So this uh, over here, this is what you're talking about also. These were binary. I used it or I didn't use it. Um, can you create a formative scale out of yes, no questions, zero, one? The answer is yes, you can. Okay. Yeah. Um, essentially, it would just be a count, right? All the ones get one, all the zeros get zero. Yeah, it still becomes an aggregated score. Oh. But more like a survey. Than more like what, sorry? More like a survey than a, than a valid reliable scale yeah it's still on the survey i don't think i understand the question ah like social demographics ah uh, yeah it's not a it's more perceptual rather than observed no maybe mm -hmm. uh, if, if we can get a latent factor or mm -hmm. on i don't know if like uh, it, i think it's formative because it could be that uh, the answers are not related because a uh, doctor can perform some kind of uh, obstetric violence and, and just one. Yes. And the other. So. Oh, like I that could be their specialty or something. Yeah. I don't know. So <clears throat> the, the point is, dang it. It did it again. <laughs> the point is, design your measures to measure what you intend to measure. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to measure, robust health, for example, well, then you better not just ask about their diet. You better ask about all of their activity. 
Um, this comes into play quite often in uh, organizational studies and business studies. Uh, when you're asking about something like organization health, you, you can't just use one measure. It doesn't work. Or CEO success, can't just use one measure. Or leadership quality, there's so many different dimensions to that that you have to have a formative factor. Um, and some of the variables you'll use will be uh, observed, actual like ROI, or not ROI, um, the price per share, PP, whatever it's called, um, PPS, uh, and other observable things. And other things will be perceptual. You ask the CEO um, things, and you ask the others in the executive suite things. Let's see if this works again. Nope, crash. Um, also, when to use objective versus perceptual. If you wanna find out about the performance of a company, do you just ask the CEO or its employees? Oh, you have to tell all wisdom straight up. Yeah, <laughs> they have no ulterior motive. CEOs. Yeah, our company's doing great. Yeah, you should buy, buy, buy. Um, yeah, so objective is, makes way more sense in many contexts. Uh, there are other times when you can't get objective data, like job satisfaction. How are you gonna get at that objectively? Or job autonomy? There are ways you can ask, well, how many of the tasks per day you, did you choose versus how many were dictated to you? Uh, how many of the hours per day did you choose to work and how many were dictated to you? Things like that. You can get objective, but uh, it's harder. Okay, we, resetting again. Oh, so sorry. If this happens more, I might ask for a different room. Okay, um, we were on, see, I'm going through slide 26, we talked about, and 27, we talked about. Essentially, the answer to 26, 27 is try Promax. That's the most acceptable right now, but there are other reasons to use, um, to use the others, which, rare. Um, extraction approach. Again, it's a tool. So play with it. How many factors do you extract? We'll extract based on eigenvalues, but also to extract based on theory. How many do you expect to see? Um, going through, we talked about scree plots, talked about the pattern matrix. And really the whole goal of the pattern matrix is to see the groupings. See if you have tight loadings within and separate loadings between factors. Convergent discriminant validity. I'll look at, this gets to sample size again. If you look at uh, slide 32, um, you'll see the sample size and loading threshold. What loading are, is acceptable for a sample size of 378 or whatever we have now? We can accept loadings down to 0.3. Now are they useful? Not terribly because uh, the measures of validity will still require them to be up at a certain level, way above 0.3. So take it for what it's worth. But if you wanna keep an item, here's your justification for keeping a low loading item. Hair, 2010, table 3-2. Yeah. If we wanted to leave an item, even though it's um, within the threshold, yeah. what do we use for justification? If you wanna delete an item, uh, if it's less than 0.5, you can just say it's not contributing positively to the convergent validity of the factor or to its reliability, period. And you'd be mathematically correct, so there's no citation needed. So uh, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but it's looking like if it goes up, the, the sample size goes up, the loading goes down. Correct, so the loading required goes down. And here's why. Um, so as the sample size increases, error decreases, right? As error decreases, we can be more confident in the, in the loadings we observe. Therefore, we can accept a lower loading and still be confident in that loading. Whereas if the sample size is low, we better have a pretty high loading because there might be a lot of variance in there, a lot of error. Okay, we talked, I'm on 33 right now. We talked about adequacy, yep. Validity, we talked about a bunch. Reliability, we talked about for convex alpha. Here's something I didn't talk about. I'm on slide 35. Um, if you want to be like super robust and rigorous and you have enough sa uh, sample size for this, 
split your data randomly <coughs> in two and do an EFA on both random samples. If the EFA comes out the same, roughly, for both samples, you have a pretty good confidence that that is the correct, correct in quotes, uh, EFA. Um, that is the correct solution. Um, and I can show you how to do that, assuming um, this ends up working again. Let's see, it's starting up again. Hey, hey, it's up again. Okay, let me show you how to do that real quick. So, in, in here, in SPSS, what you would do is you go to data. Oh, where to go? Oh, where to go? Here we go. Thank you. Select cases. Data, select cases. And you would select a random sample. Here's random right here. Select a random sample. Click on the sample and say, I want roughly 50% of all the data. And you hit OK. Hit OK. And it produces, if I go back to the data view, you can see it has randomly sliced off half the data. These ones that have slashes through it, they will not be included in any of your analyses. So you can go run that factor analysis again. Here's the factor analysis that we ran last time. See if it turns out just fine. Um, we actually ran it, the one we accepted was uh, that one, I think. Actually, no, this, this last one we ran was fine. Um, so we got a pattern matrix. And it looks pretty close. Social desirability four seems to fall out, but everything else looks pretty good. So we can be fairly confident that our uh, EFA came up with a good stable solution, a good reliable solution. If we want to do this again, just rerun it. Now, if you if you if you don't, if you come up with a different, well, it was pretty close, except for like so. If we had like uh, info act four or five. Yeah. One of them we had a little bit of trouble with, right? Five, maybe, or something. Yeah, five was right? a problem. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, might split a little bit differently, but if, if you saw some cross loading where you didn't see it before, that would be an indication that five had maybe some problems. So we'll probably, so my guess is in the CFA, we're going to drop five. Have a low load in there, probably drop it. Yeah, that's my guess. But if, if, in, if by and large it is the same, which is what we're seeing here, uh -huh. you'd say, ah, oh, it's a pretty reliable solution. And you could report that. You say, we split our, our sample into two randomly and tried it on both. And it came up with roughly the same solution. There was only one item difference. That's all. Okay. If you want to reset your, uh, if you want to reset your data so it doesn't stay like that, go to data, select cases, and reset. That'll uncross off everything. Here's reset. And then hit OK. And then if you go back to your data set, you'll see it's all selected now. It's all available. Yeah. Nice and easy. Okay. So glad this is working for now. Um, talked about reliability, Comix Alpha. Exercise. Oh, these are, if you want to, if you want to practice what we did, do this afterwards or tomorrow. Um, but if there's extra time, I want to show you some stuff and I do. Uh, and I'm going to go through a few of these real quick. Uh, saving factor scores. This is important. In the EFA, um, there is in this scores button here. If you click on that, there is an option to save factor scores as variables. What this will do will say here, here are all our items surrounding a factor. What's its factor score? The centroid essentially and it'll produce a value, a measured value for the factor at large. Um, so let me continue, let me continue, let me zoom out. I'm actually gonna go over to principal components, which came up with a cleaner solution for us. Um, and I'm gonna run that, continue and okay. And this will produce, we see our regular pattern matrix, it looks great, but what this did is over in our data set, it produced new variables. Whoop. Here they are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight new variables because we had eight factors extracted. So this extracted a score for what is factor one? Let's find out. Factor one is usefulness. So the usefulness value for respondent number one is negative 1.8. So we actually have a value now. 
for usefulness. I'm going to go name this right now. Down here on the variable view, I'm going to say this is usefulness. Usefulness. Quick clarification: When you did the same as variables, was it regression, Bartlett, or Anderson? Oh, uh, I believe I used regression. Let me check real quick. No, you're good. Uh, in the scores, I saved with regression method. Yeah. Uh, which one's the correct one? Yeah. Use regression. Okay. Um, the second one is anxiety. The third one is playfulness. Fourth one is decision quality. And the second, fifth one was info acquisition. And then comp use. And then social desirability positive and negative. Social desirability positive, social desirability negative. I'm gonna go like neg and pause. Social desirability, pause, there we go. Okay, so now we actually have scores we can use in regressions or in ANOVAs or in whatever we wanna use them for. We could literally, right now, we could go do a regression, analyze, regression, linear, and go see, let's see, uh, get rid of these, and put our factor scores in here. I wanna know what predicts decision quality. I'm gonna throw all this in here. And run it. Look at this. Looks like anxiety and playfulness don't predict decision quality, neither does comp use, but information acquisition and usefulness predict decision quality, both in positive direction. Cool. Anyway, but now you can use it in causal analyses. This isn't a causal, a latent causal model, this isn't SEM, but it is uh, first generation regressions and you can use them in that way. And they are more, these factor scores are more valid than an average score. Um, in fact, I have an average, real quick, check this out. We have an average um, for enjoyment right here. I'm gonna put enjoyment, except we don't use enjoyment. Let's see, usefulness decision quality. Here's decision quality and uh, we have decision quality factor score as well. I'm gonna correlate these. So this decision quality average is just an average, whereas decision quality, this one is a factor score. Let's see how strongly they're correlated. They are correlated, 0.947, very strongly, as they should be, but not point, it's not, it's not 1.0. So there is a difference between these two, an average and a factor score. And the factor score is more accurate because it's accounting for all other influences in the data uh, for the variables we included. And it's also accounting for the weight of the loading of the item. So for example, um, let me zoom out here, back over here, if I were to go up to here, um, the loading of, of, these are all pretty tight, but let's say for this one, uh, is that pretty visible? Yeah, uh, this item is more central than this item over here. And so this item would receive a greater weight than this item when we calculate the factor score. Whereas an average just is an equal weighting to everything. And so it weights the strongest factor, the one correlated most strongly to the other items in there, uh, more weightily than the outlying indicators. In that case, it's US like a nucleus, right? It's like a, a centroid or a nucleus, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we use centroid in statistics. So the factor score is like the centroid. Cool. Which is better than an average. Okay. Cool. Let's go to the end here. Second order factors. What do you do? What do you do with second order factors? I should have planned better um, and included a second order factor in here. But when I was uh, collecting this data, I didn't think I'd do a boot camp eight years ago. Um, but I have a slide. I have a slide on this. Over here. Where did I put it? It's over here. It's, it's actually in my CFA, I think. 
Do do do. Oh yeah, there's one there. It's not what I was thinking, but uh, this will do for now. Um, so this is uh, a second order factor. We sort of talked about second order factors with that little pop quiz. Uh, the red one was uh, three lower order reflective dimensions and then a higher order formative dimension um, or factor. Over here, we have another sort of formative factor. It's this higher order thing that is comprised of curiosity and creativity. Curiosity and creativity happen to be very highly correlated. Um, the more curious you are, the more creative you typically are. The more creative you are, the more curious you typically are. Um, and so when we run them through an EFA and through a CFA, they don't separate. They hold together really strongly. And so we would say that these are part of a second order construct. Um, something like innovativeness or creativity. We just call it creativity and say it's combined with creativity and curiosity. Um, something like that, or curious nature. Um, and this is the second order construct. In the EFA, what do you do with that? Um, you do sort of like what we did for social desirability. Because we did have a, we actually do have a second order factor here, social desirability. is comprised of two things, um, the negative and the positive aspects. And so we do exactly what we did here. We took it out of our regular EFA and tried to separate the dimensions there. And now if you have a complex second order factor with like more than two dimensions, you may wanna just leave it separate and not even try to bring it back in with all the other factors. Because most likely scenario, it's gonna collapse again onto a single column, a single factor. Um, so if you have a second order factor, just, if it's complex, keep it separate, do its own factor analysis, and then do a factor analysis on all the reflective first order dimensions uh, otherwise. So shouldn't the arrows on that slide, if it's formative, shouldn't they have been? Ah, in this case, I'm saying it's reflective because <laughs> this is where it gets a little <clears throat> stinky. Um, in, a, in Amos, Amos doesn't handle formative factors. And so if you are, determined to use Amos, you have to model it reflectively. And then you can justify it statistically, uh, even though theoretically they are different. We could say somebody who's more curious doesn't have to be more creative. Um, somebody who's more creative doesn't have to be more curious. The thing is they tend to move together pretty consistently. And so they could be statistically consistently modeled reflectively without being inconsistent <laughs> theoretically. Um, <laughs> I know it's, it's, it's a fuzzy line. I'm not an accountant, but it is a fuzzy line. Um, so, but you, why would you just use PLS or something at this point? Okay. So this is a, this is come, brings up a good question. Why not just use PLS and model it formatively the way it was meant to be modeled? Um, cause it is, it is truly formative. These are two different dimensions that are not the same thing. They're not interchangeable, right? They just happen to be strongly correlated. Um, the answer is a pragmatic one. Um, for any who have tried to publish papers using PLS before, it's kind of tricky. I actually tried to submit one to one of our top journals in information systems. And they said, this is a great paper. We love it. Beautiful theory. PLS. Do it all over in Amos. Yeah. And we said, well, we use PLS because we have formative factors. They said, nope, doesn't matter. Aggregate them. Okay, well, aggregate it and use Amos. Fine. They, they don't know how to assess it. They're like PLS. We don't we don't understand how to use PLS, so we can't we can't validate your paper. We can't review it. So use Amos, and then we'll review your paper. But are they more up on it now? Yeah, now it's better. This was ten years ago. Yeah. I'm old. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I, I would smart PLS in. What is that? I've just seen several using the smart PLS. It's getting a lot more acceptable, yeah. Before though, it was squirrely because the PLS programs that were out there were bug ridden and sort of slapped together. But now there's actual funding behind the uh, development of these programs. So they're a lot better. Uh, the whole argument over formative versus reflective was helpful. It was a big deal for a while. We had to read all those papers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's up? Can I ask a question for the sake of intellectual argument? Uh oh, you're an academic. <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's not among us. Oh, okay. 
to try to justify why that could be a uh, reflective. Mm. I mean, it's interesting too because you know the differentiation between reflective and formative, the fact that reflective they're highly correlated amongst each other. Statistically, yes. And then we, even from a theoretical perspective, do we do we didn't we just say that those two variables are they are highly correlated uh, dimensions, and so couldn't we justify it as being reflective? The answer is yes, and we probably would. Um, but if we were being theoretical purists, I uh, would say no, these are separate dimensions, and in a perfect world, I can be curious and not creative. And I can be creative and not curious. But Let me be me. World, you could say you can, right? In, 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 in an economically efficient world, we can say no. No, no. If you're curious, you're also creative. If you're creative, you're also curious by definition, because that's how we need to scope our model. So it's, it's academic aeros, uh, wordsmithing. I mean, yeah, aerosmithing. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I wonder why. Just uh, I mean, IBM, you know, kind of come up with something that can take care of uh, a formative. You know, I mean, to come up with something like SPSS that handles, uh, you know model rather than just um, I mean I don't know <laughs> the, the reason uh, for those who didn't catch all that why doesn't IBM just make it so Amos can handle formative models come on what does an IBM do a Mac version yeah why doesn't IBM do a Mac version here's the reason IBM doesn't care about Amos um, I've actually emailed them I've emailed Amos and said hey look I, I have quite a large following uh, people who use Amos because of my videos, I like to take credit. Um, and, uh, and they say, yeah, we don't deal with third party developers. Was it? No. They don't want to talk to me, <laughs> but I'll keep promoting the product and putting it down. Um, let's see. If you're looking for data, I got some great data in late April that is very similar to what you showed today. I even have a theoretical model. Cool. Robert, I might end up using it depending on uh, where we go with this. I would like to take someone's messy data who has struggled with an EFA and solve it for them. Um, I know, you may not show me yours. <laughs> yeah, anyone not from case. <laughs> so every, every year we do this. So will you email me or thumb drive me your data? Um, I don't have a thumb drive. Oh, I, or so email I can, it to me? Email, email me your data. Or I can put it in the, in the Google Drive. If you're okay with everybody having access to it. Or you can just email it to me. I'll just, I'll just email Okay. It. So we're going to get someone else's data here. Every year, um, I take someone's data that they've struggled with mightily for months, and we try to solve it. Uh, the first time, and every time I do this, I sweat a lot, because I have no, I've never, I don't, I, what's, what's your name? Marie. Marie. I don't know Marie. I've, we haven't collaborated. I've never seen her data before she sends it to me. And I have no clue what's going to happen. Nothing up my sleeves. Um, so, but every time it's worked out. So thanks for praying for me. Um, anyway. And it's always magical because it's always a doctoral student. And they're always like, you saved my PhD. This may be a question. <laughs> Or, uh, tomorrow or okay. later on, but <coughs> I'm a little confused on the fact that we have two marker variables ah. when we're doing these uh, correlating yeah. factor. How is that going to play? We'll talk out? about the method bias a lot tomorrow. Okay. Um, but yeah, this question we have two marker variables. We thought we had one, but we actually have two. Um, two is better than one in the case of a marker variable. Okay. Uh, five is better than two. Yeah, if you can, the more you can parcel out, uh, parcel. Out. We'll talk more about this tomorrow. But the more you can uh, discriminate between method bias and shared variance, which is what you're doing with a marker variable, um, the better. Because the fewer markers you have, the less capability you have of distinguishing between actual shared trait variance and method variance. <coughs> so more is better. Okay. Yeah. Actually, yeah. what's the EFA and the pattern metrics? For example, one variable becomes a two group data. How should we do that? If one variable splits into two, what should we do? Yes, two groups. 
So this happened. So the question for the remote folks who here, what happens if you, uh, you're running your EFA and you have one variable that splits into two? Uh, this happened with us just now, but also I, when I collected this data, when I designed the survey, I did not have information acquisition and decision quality in here. I had system satisfaction. I had one construct. That's what I call it, system satisfaction. And then it split into two. And I was like, wait, 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 what? And so I looked at the items and it turns out, oh, the, all these five were about information acquisition, but these eight were about decision quality. Okay, well, so I split them. What are these, uh, well, with this kind of metrics? Yeah. We keep track of seven variables. Yeah. But each variable comes in two groups of data. Oh, what if what if in one column you have two groups yes. two groups of loadings? Yes. Oh, oh, and that's then, a problem. And each of them they jam together. Each yeah, yeah. So this might happen with information acquisition decision quality, or remember before it happened with social desirability half and half, right? It all smacked into one, um, even though we expected two. Yeah. So what do you do there? What you do is you do a separate EFA in order to uh, just with that factor. We'll probably see this with Marie's data, is my guess. We're going to see multiple. <laughs> we're going to see a lot of mess. Uh, we're going to see multiple factors or multiple constructs load on the same factor. Okay. I emailed it. All right. I also sent you my model. Oh, so okay. That'll, that'll help. help. That'll help a lot. Okay. So, so what should we do? With this kind of so, in that case, you, you run a separate EFA just with those items and then try to separate them in that separate EFA. We're going to do it right now. Yeah, we're gonna do it because I guarantee you she'll have a discriminant validity problem. If if you you struggled through this EFA quite a bit, um, I've been trying to figure out what to do with it all. You haven't come to a good solution. No, I haven't. Yes, that's what I want to hear. <laughs> good. Is it keeping you up at night? It's yes. Is your health waning because of it? Um, I would not pass that rule. Uh, do well on. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So it's in Excel. I'll pull it over into SPSS. Um, and here's your model. Uh, I'm going to uh, make this bigger. Okay. Okay. So you're trying to predict hireability. Yeah. Task performance organizational session. So Formative. Right. So higher ability is the higher order construct. Yeah. That's being predicted by task and also social media deviance, which is not in there yet. Okay. Liking, similarity. This is cool. We're gonna play with this. Okay. Um, I'm going there's to two there's two groups and they're marked um, labeled mm -hmm. S and R P and R. And the R's are for the religious experiment, and the P's are for the political. Do you want me to keep them separate? Or they're separate. They were run as two separate, but collected at the same time. Same variables? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. See, but versus like P person, that's from the uh, political part of it. And then there's a R person, which uh. is from the uh, religious part. Condition, response ID, ah, P per, I see. So the question then is, do we have full data for everyone? Roughly, okay. Yeah, I removed all of those already. Cool. All right, let's have some fun. And then we need to take out the top row there. I didn't That's know. fine, no problem. Okay. Is this what it was talking about in call tracks? This is what it looked like after I cleaned it up coming out of call tricks. Okay. So we're just going to do an EFA. There's other stuff we could do, but we're going to play with the EFA. That's cool. You already sort of screened it. Yeah, uh, it's got, yeah. It's, cool. Here we go. I'm just going to copy all of this uh, and stick it in. 371. Nice. That's really good. I'm going to stick this in here. Yeah. 
Assuming you paste. Come on, SPSS. Just thinking about it. It's a lot of data. And then go get the variable names over here. Want to see a trick? Control C. Ooh, ooh. Oh, wait, there are more? No, here we go. Uh, control V, Control T, Control C, Alt Tab. And then paste it in here. Ha! Oh, we have a duplicate name somewhere. That is a lot of variables. Well, wow. it's repeated twice. Oh, okay. So I did one for religion. If you pull up my model. Mm -hmm. So partisanship or religion. Yeah. So partisanship political was one experiment and we ran through everything. Got it. And then religion was the other one. Okay. And we ran through everything. Okay. So exactly the same question for both. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, then a bunch of demographics. Yeah. R. Oh, I see. P P R. Okay. Got it. So what you what you what you could do uh, is actually I might do this. Are they in the same order? Mm -hmm. Sim like. Then I go down here, and uh, R sim like. Nice. Okay. What I might do is back over here is stack it. Ooh. Yeah, because it's missing here because this is all the religion. Uh, those you can those are the just the conditions that were were put in randomized. I wasn't sure if I could just delete those or not, oh, okay. but it's already been coded as to what condition. Oh okay. It was they were in. But I don't know why all those are zero. They shouldn't be blanks. No, they're not blanks either. Must not have copied over. Okay. No, none of that is blank here. All right, I'll import the data again. Okay, that's weird. Uh, control A, delete. Yes. Go back here. And. Oh, it's because of that. Yep, got it. Oops. Let's copy. There it is. Gotcha. Oop. Aha. Okay. Copy. Paste. <clears throat> Please work this time. We have 30 minutes. Let's see what we can do. As soon as it pastes over. Paste, please. Here we go. Okay. And it's all here now. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to do a factor analysis of, let's just start with political. That's about right. Yeah. That one. Cool. Are these <clears throat> oh, attention to paying attention attention trap? Okay. Are they would you, are these all the latent factors for political roughly? I think so. Cool. Um, and let's yeah, I played the P in front of them. I mean. Okay. Rotation. Chromex and so press more efficient point three to start and see what happens. And then, okay, here we go. Great camo, great extractions or communalities. We extracted 10 factors, which is more than I, we expected, right? Probably, probably. Oh. We'll find out. Uh, scroll down here. Got 
a little error, that's fine. Ah, ha, 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 ha. All right, here's the pattern matrix. What a mess. It's a beautiful mess. Okay, okay, here we go. This is great. Do you have the wording of the questions? I have them all right here. Oh, do you have them digitally? Um, I do. Excellent, you email that to me? Okay, so <clears throat> per sim, whatever that is, is uh, fabulous. Does anything load with it? Nope. So per sim is solid. This one is two things loading together, PTP and POCB. We'll look into those in a moment. This one, PCW, is a second order factor. And it all loads together. Nice. So what we'll probably end up doing is sticking that as a second, as a, as a separate EFA. So I'm going to start with that. I'm just going to remove PCW right now. Is it a second order factor PCW? Excellent. Called it PCW. PCW. You're out. How'd you know that? Because they were all named PCW, <laughs> um, but then had different uh, ends. One's BP. D and BI and BOD and gotcha. <laughs> yeah. all be questions. Yeah, they're all questions, uh, but they're all part of some higher order factor. Somehow they're connected to each other. Exactly. So I'm going to keep them in a separate EFA. Oh, look at that. That's better. PSM also multi-dimensional. What is DID? Oh, here's an attention trap. Let me get rid of that real quick. It's all right. Let's not worry about it. Why don't you just walk me through some of them? You have the questions in front of you, and um, we can just walk through some of it. So let's do this. If we look down at this new pattern matrix, um, we got rid of PCW or whatever it was um, because it's a second order factor. Was it PCW? Sorry, I don't know. PCW? Yeah, so we got rid of those for now because they're a part of a second order factor. So we're going to test those separately. Um, is PSM also a second order factor? PSM, DP, and DID, and DOD. Yes, those are also second order. Okay, so I'm going to take that out as well. PSM, gone. Everything that's left, are these first order factors? I think so. Yeah, I think those were the only two that I had a second order. Cool. Now let's look at it. Okay, we extracted that many, which is probably what we expected. And look how beautiful that is. You have a more beautiful pattern matrix than mine was. This is amazing. Huh? So. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. No, you, you, do you see it? It's gorgeous. <laughs> you don't have a single loading less than 0.5. It's amazing. And every item loads where it's supposed to. So I'm going to copy this out and do an email to you. We're okay if you start crying. <laughs> um, so let's go to your email. I would. I have had a student cry in, in the boot camp before because of this very thing. I, he said, I've been working on this for four months. Oh, come on. Four months, yeah. All right, so that's the first piece. Let me put it, let's now do the second order factors. Can we see in her, uh, oh, in her model? model? Yeah. Well, which ones did you take out? So which ones did I take out? Um, counterproductive work behavior, under higher ability evaluation. Higher ability. You took out counterproductive work behavior. Oh, so this is a third order factor. And you took out um, the one that I don't have in there in this okay. model, which is social media deviance. Okay, so let's go to counterproductive work behaviors real quick. C, W, B, or whatever it was in here. Um, so let's do another factor analysis. So we don't have to delete a single item. So actually, if we're, that's the way, then it would be task performance, and that other one would also be what we're calling second order. Cool. Oh, all so three of these. Um, task performance, yeah. So task performance is second order itself. Because what if... Yeah, come and show me. Just for simplicity, do, is there a whiteboard thing? Uh, oh. Nobody remotely will be able to see you, but um, if can you point? And I can point. Well, just for simplicity, this uh -huh. is the way that looked, mm -hmm. but it's really being modeled as separately. It's really, yeah. So okay. all of these are formative into higher ability. Ah, got so it. So these are reflective. Task performance has its own questions, which are got reflective. It. Okay. So let's go back over to here in the factor analysis. 
we're going to run a separate factor analysis for, I'm going to get rid of these, for P PCW, or is PCW not being included? I, sorry. Uh, yeah, it is. Okay. So we're going to run a separate one for this. Now for this one, uh, let's try it with principal components. I might have to split it out into principal axis factoring. We'll see. I'm going to run this and it says we're going to pull out four factors. We look at the pattern matrix and it looks like it didn't pull out the way we wanted. Um, we would expect Remind me real quick, this one, is this the one in the model or not in the model? That's in the model. Okay, so we do want to solve this one? Well, I want to solve them all. But yes. <laughs> but this, this is one of the ones we want to solve? Yes. Okay. This is one that's once, everything that's there is in the model. Okay. So, the, uh, let me zoom in here so you can see what we're looking at. So, BPD, it loaded beautifully by itself. That's great. We have no problems there. BID, loaded together, but it loaded also with BI, oh, what is BI3? Is that? Um, counterproductive work behavior, oh, what, there's supposed to be a D right there. It, what's so funny is it loads separately too. <laughs> it's like, it's like it knows it doesn't belong. <laughs> no, it's like, you won't treat me like everyone else. I'll, I'll show you. Just rename it and it'll know. That's right, just rename it and it'll fix itself. Let's do this. Let's let's test this hypothesis. Um, so over here in variable view, um, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? P I D P C W B I D. There it is. Um, F two D. It really should not fix it. <laughs> if so, IBM is, yeah. Okay, it's the same, okay. Um, that would've been hilarious. Uh, so what I would do at this point is I would look at that question, and I'd be like, I, I'd look at that question, see how different it is from one and two, and uh, four and five and six, and see if it really is asking something unique, and different, or was it an attention trap, or something like that. Uh, I marked all the attention. Right. So you might look at BID3 and see why it's different. In this case, if assuming these are reflective dimensions, we have seven of them. I'm just going to get rid of number three um, for now. BID3, you're gone. Okay. We run it again. Look at the pattern matrix. Okay. BID holds together, has a little bit of loading with BOD. There's BOD right here. Okay. Does it mean when there's something above one? Yeah. The Haywood case, it's an estimation error. Okay. So those you deal with very last, because usually they resolve themselves um, when you reduce the error. So let's play with this a bit. We want to distinguish between BID and BOD. Um, and the way we'll do that is looking at where we're loading in the wrong place or loading too strongly. So like 11 and 12, they're loading in the wrong place. Um, they would be the first ones I'd get rid of. Yep. I'm going to start there. BOD is reflective. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's not going to kill us to get rid of a couple. You got 14. Yeah, that's a lot. Typically, when I see more than five indicators on a reflective scale, I think, eh, there's probably multiple dimensions in that. Well, they've been debating that one back and forth. So ah. included everything. Cool. Well, we can help them in their debate. <laughs> <laughs> so tell them 11 and 12 don't belong. Okay. Here we go. Oh, looking cleaner already. And the OD... Three. I'm going to take out three before I take out one or two. So BOD. Why, why would you take two first? So why not two first? Two, it's not breaking any rules. Um, it loads negatively onto the second component and Haywoodly onto the first uh, factor here. But that might resolve itself. If it doesn't, maybe I'll change the extraction method. If a Haywood 
result itself, does it usually have a high road? Again? It does. Yeah, it still has like a 0.9 something. So this is uh, BOD3. You're gone. Before I remove any more, I'm going to change the extraction method. Because you, you want to remove as few as possible. Let's change this to maximum likelihood. Look at that. So one is still a little bit in violation. You still have a Haywood case here, but it's not that big of a deal. Everything else looks really good, actually. Let's just see if getting rid of BOD1 fixes this issue, uh, including the Haywood. Didn't fix the Haywood, but it sure fixed everything else. Um, that Haywood, I mean, we can fix the Haywood by changing to Verimax <coughs> or something. Or we can change the rotation method. If we go like this, that Haywood's gone. Um, go down here to rotated factor matrix. Nope, not that one. Whoop. Whoa, where'd it go? This is it, that didn't help anything. Okay, let's change that rotation. I never used yeah, it. Yeah, I know it would, that's right, fix that. Let's try principal axis factoring just to try the gamut. There you go. There it is. Okay, that's PCW. So this, was, this is all of the second order. Factors. Yeah, so this is a separate second order, one of them, its dimensions. We're going to try the other second order in a separate EFA. So I'm going to email this to you. Okay, there's that. Do you yeah. to do each second order separately? When there are more than two dimensions in that second order, yeah. Because otherwise what happens in the massive EFA is that they just collapse into a single factor. There are just so many other factors pushing on it. So then how do we do Pull them back together. I won't pull them back together. Ever, so yeah, because even in the CFA, they won't be together. Okay. I'm going to separate them out as a second order factor. They'll be in the same CFA, but it's guided. And so it's not like it's wondering, should I be with these other people? Uh, it, we're telling them where to go. In the structural model, though, you're going to do that. In the, in the measurement model. We'll do it tomorrow. You'll see tomorrow and we'll do a second order factor. Um, okay, so that's really exciting. We got that one resolved. Can you find the pieces like this one? Woo. What was the other second order we were looking at? PSM? Was it PSM? That is a second order. I don't remember if that's one that you took out or not. I think it is. I think we got rid of that one for a sec. Okay, let's try this one. Um, splits into two, but I bet there are three. Let's see. Here's the, oh, where'd you go? Pattern matrix. So there should be three. Yeah. So what we're going to do, oh, those look strongly together. Yikes. Uh, we're going to force it to three, see what happens. You can't see, you can get as close as you want. Um, extraction, you can get closer if you need. The attention check is in there. Oh, whoops. Get rid of that guy. And then we're expecting DOD, DID, and DPD, three. So I, I'm forcing it to three right now. And do I feel bad about forcing it to three? No, I really don't. Cause look at this eigenvalue. The third one, it didn't extract, it was 0.946 or, nine, yeah, 946. That is really close to one. So I don't feel that bad about forcing it to three. Um, go down here. Also, the error is only 1%, so not bad. Here we go. It didn't work, but that was an interesting exercise. Um, okay. What we want to do, what we want to do is we're going to try a different rotation method, or I mean, a different extraction method. We're on principal axis factoring. Let's switch to principal components. Try that. Still no good. I don't think we're going to fix it with this either, but we'll try uh, maximum likelihood. Still no good. So my question then is, what is DID and what is DOD? Uh. That is social media deviance, interpersonal deviance, and social media deviance, organizational deviance. Interpersonal deviance and organizational deviance. Mm -hmm. Are they the same questions? No. They, no. Mm -mm. 
did the QSort and pilot rate were They did separate. Can you give me an example of uh, the wording of a couple of them? Ashley was able to email it. Oh, you emailed it to me. Cool. And it's on the list of my two drive because your file was too large. Oh. Oh, okay. So it's in the Google Drive. Well, I sent you an email with a oh. link. Oh, with a link. Okay. There we go. PDF. Okay. Yes, I consent. Uh, and where might I find it? There's a 64 page document. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking for production deviants. So if you. Um, if I search for what? The uh, uh, PD, probably, if that's what it is. PD, CWB. Um, keep going. SMD. Exactly. We were we were on social media deviance, right? So yeah. this is all the is whole it? section will all be the, the three different aspects of Here social we go. media deviance. There we go. Okay. OD so we were struggling between O D and ID, right? Yes. Okay. Here's ID and O D. So here's <clears throat> ID right here. Based on what you've seen, use the following items to tell us what kind of employee you think the job applicant will be. I predict this applicant would use social media to gossip about a coworker, use social media to post negative remarks about someone at work, use social media to post negative content about someone else at work. Please select agree for this statement. Use social media to spread rumors. So it's all about gossip. Okay, using social media to slander yeah, and gossip. Now let's use organizational. Use social media to post negative content about the organization. Ah, so it's the same, but replace organization in there. Almost. Confidential information. It's not all the same. All right. So there's some other stuff in there. So what's happened here is because you're asking someone to reflect on something they don't know for sure. And they, they have a, what's the word stereotype in their mind. And so they are generalizing to the stereotype. And that is exactly what you, I'm trying to say is that people oh. are stereotyping people. And their stereotyping is giving blank, blanket uh, assumptions about this person. And we assume that they will both be interpersonally a problem and organizationally a problem. Blanket across the board. Um, and that's why these sets of items load together. It's because if I answer, people aren't separating out we're not exactly. Well, they're not separating out how they'll interact interpersonally and organizationally. They're not distinguishing between these two things when they're making assumptions in the Q sort. I can see how this would totally separate out. No problem. But when I'm thinking about it, answering and surveying myself, it's the same thing. Uh, this person's negligent. They're careless. Um, I can totally paint a picture of the stereotype. Um, and so I'm going to answer accordingly and I'll be very consistent. And that's why in the EFA, they all load together. And so what do you do with that? You have options. You can say, sort of depends on the literature actually. Is this an established scale in the literature? No, that's my creation. Ah, okay. Um, this gives I you more argue, flexibility. Yeah, because I was arguing that if they don't like the person, if they're stereotyping, they're not going to like them, or they're going to like them all okay. the way across. Okay. So since this is your own scale, here's what I would do. I would reduce this to a two-dimensional construct and say that uh, respondents cannot distinguish between interpersonal and organizational. After all, an organization is made up of interpersonal connections. Um, so what I would do is I would take the stronger of the two, which in this case is DOD, organizational, and I would use it as the primary, um, as the primary trait. Get rid of DOD for a second. Extraction, do it based on eigenvalues. Now we're down to two factors that separate pretty cleanly, uh, except number five. Number five seems to be useless. Number five on uh, DP, which is over here. 
number five is use social media away typo. There's your problem right there. Uh, typos throw people off. Uh, this one right here. Oh, that wasn't one that you were looking at though. That's I know. Media. Yeah, uh, but that's, yeah, right here, right? Number five? Oh, uh, production, yeah. Yeah, so number five failed. Why? Because there's a typo in it. Isn't that silly? <clears throat> um, they will use social media away that negative, and they're like, I don't know how to answer this. There's a typo. My brain doesn't function under robust circumstances. So they just put whatever. Isn't that crazy that it'll cause that much trouble? Just a little typo. It's because when you take surveys, especially surveys that are 64 pages long, um, you want to invest as little cognitive effort as possible. And so you just, if it doesn't make sense, skip or whatever. So we know why that one failed. So in this case, unfortunately, I would delete number five because we don't know how they answered it. Um, and if that's gonna work, what we might do is try to stick this back in with everything else. There's a bit of a hay wood there, but that's no problem. Um, let's try to throw in everything else again with these guys. See if that works. So per sim, like, all these guys go back in. And not piece out, not this one. What about these two? PTP and POC. And not any of these. Not PSM. PSM. PID, right? We need to include those. PDIS. Oh, just these. Okay. Let's see what happens. It worked. I'd wait for it. Okay. 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 Let me go back to here. I want to see what method I used in this one. I used principal components and Promex. Let me just try that here. Um, extraction, principal components. And I'm already using Promex. Pattern matrix. So a little bit messier. <clears throat> but if we go back to here, that's pretty slick. Um, P like three, a little low. These P, oh, P, uh uh, oh, wait up. P like and per sim went together. Uh oh, PTP and POC went together. It's not perfect. Did we have those before? P like and per sim, yeah, and they were separated. Yes. Yeah, um, those are two things. Actually, these two. Um, different model that was combined in there. PTP and POC B. Person and white. Um, so these two, we we actually we missed we missed these are, last time. Whoops. Are new and included, but the other two, person and per white. Per those white. should be different. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's force this out to how many we think. Uh, one, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We should expect eight. Let's see if we can get eight. And when we do that, it comes up with clean, clean, cleanish, clean not clean. So these two load together. Super strong. So consistent. PTP and POCB, those... Oh, yeah. Well, those are positive things. So. Oh, they might just move together naturally. Yeah. What are they? Uh, they're going to do their job well. Um, they're going to help other people in the organization. Oh, same so idea as the other, but the opposite. The same as the stereotyping. Yeah, the stereotyping. So you might pick one. Um, do you want to pick one or just keep them together as a new construct? I think just as a new construct. Cool. They're going that strong they are. together. And I think it makes the argument for people are, for what my whole argument has been about people relying on stereotypes instead of Excellent. looking at the actual individual. Then I'm going to force this to seven. And clean, 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 clean. Clean. This cross loading is not not meaningful. It's farther than 0.2 away. This works. This is your final solution. Um, right here, I'll get rid of this one because this is 
not as good. Delete and paste this in here. So you have two pattern matrices. This one with everything except uh, PCW, which is here. So with these two together, and you, you'll rename um, this right here as some single construct, uh, then you're good. That's, that, that'll work. Does that work? But you just got me further than I've gotten in the last month. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that just sent to you. Um, so hopefully that'll help. Woohoo! Okay. Um, that was way easier than last year. Man, last year's I sweat so bad. We finally figured it out. We did it, but it was intense. Okay. Uh, any final questions? Yeah. You use different kind of expressions, yeah. So for the same model, can you use different? Yeah, for the same model, you can use different extraction methods. Um, like Harris said, they're just tools to sort of explore your data. Uh, there are some purists who say, no, 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 no. You must use uh, principal axis factoring if your variables are not supposed to be related to each other. You must use principal components if your variables are strongly related to each other. You must use maximum likelihood always. Or, but you'll be a purist in any type of analysis. The practical matter is it's just a tool. Any other questions before we finish? Right. I used different ones for uh, the one I sent you. I think had two different methods. Uh, the answer is yeah. And if somebody calls you out on it, say, Joe Harris said it's just a tool. <laughs> so are you. Right? Um, something like that. And if they disagree with Joe Harris, they're going to disagree with you no matter what you say. Because okay. Joe Harris is the authority. So let them take it up again. So tomorrow you'll go into a little bit more uh, under, for us to understand the, this whole second order. Oh, yeah. We'll do the second order in the CFA as well. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, remote folks. I'll post these videos um, hopefully tonight. I just have to convert them uh, and then upload them. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I only sent one. Oh, okay. I'm sorry.